plus lectures plus something else uh, all the time. Uh, so I just asking, let me know when I'm wanted. What's, what, what's the best time for you? We have a couple of time slots available. Just, uh, what is in the menu? Fish or meat? Oh, oh. <laughs> I will have to ask my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Just give me the choice. <laughs> uh, if if we, we will make it, uh, let's say, uh, closer to the end, it might be something like, um, let me check again, something like uh, 1530. Oh, it too, I, I, anything. Okay, then... Then let's 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 make it the other way, and let's uh, let's make it just a second. Thirteen thirty. Thirteen thirty. Perfect. Great. Uh, Vladimir, should we have breaks? Uh, as as we decided before. Yes, I think we we, we have plans. Uh, in between the sessions, Great. And, uh, the program hasn't been corrected much, but, but some replacements might take place because of the experts' time schedules. And uh, please feel free to uh, either to participate uh, or just leave the table for some time. I don't think we need all the audience all the time, whatever you say. Uh, absolutely right. And we're enough flexible. Thank you. But what uh, I would like to ask you, so uh, the time for presentation, 10 minutes, no more. Do you yeah. agree with it? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I think that was expected, actually. That's what we yes, as it was expected, because in our experience, uh, people try to speak much more than 10 minutes. <laughs> really? It's, well, sometimes it's interesting, but... If uh, many of them speak uh, for such a long time, the conference, uh, well, uh, becomes too, too long. Uh, yeah. That's why the uh, are needed. By, by it, the way. It's sometimes unbearable. Yeah, that's right. Let me give you the instruction I received from Academician and there is, we have such big economists in, in Moscow. When I was 30 years old, I was speaking first time at the, at the Academic Council in Imemo. He told me three rules for the young speaker, but probably it's more un universal rule. Number one, uh, save a minute. Means don't even take your time, maybe save a minute. Second, uh, don't, uh, I don't know how to translate, but in Russian, it's не выворачивай карман. Don't Okay. Try don't, don't to say it. everything you know. Office, yes. And point number three, uh, tell at least something interesting, not to you, but to the audience. <laughs> well, uh, well uh, dear colleagues, we should start. Okay. Dr. Rar, good day. Ah, здравствуйте всем. Hello. Thank you for invitation. Сейчас мы попробуем ролик запустить с приветствием. Мы с вами все делаем, поэтому нас можно. Володя, ролик виден? Нет. Нет еще. Сейчас. Сейчас. Вот что у нас тут получится. Сейчас.
Уважаемые коллеги, дорогие друзья, разрешите от имени факультета глобальных процессов Московского университета, всех организаторов нашего общего дела, шестого международного научного конгресса «Глобалистика-2020» от всей души искренне поприветствовать, пожелать успеха в работе и, конечно, сейчас крепкого инициатив нашего факультета, инициатив Московского университета последних лет. Самое важное, что эта инициатива была поддержана фактически всем глазовательным сообществом. Этому проекту уже более 10 лет. Дело в том, что первый конгресс прошел еще в 2009 году, и он стал здесь научной площадкой для обсуждения таких перспективных научных междисциплинарных направлений в области, в первую очередь, глобальных исследований учеными фактически всего мира. И было очень приятно, что начиная с первого конгресса, и вот уже шестой конгресс мы проводим, площадки нашего научного мероприятия собрали фактически ну, 10-15 тысяч ученых из более чем 50 стран мира, фактически со всех континентов, кроме Антарктиды. А среди гостей, основных спикеров конгресса стали, без сомнения, всемирно известные ученые, выдающиеся специалисты, которые сделали себе не только яркое, всем известное имя, но и внесли существенный вклад в развитие научных исследований, внесли существенный вклад в решение глобальных проблем. За годы проведения, еще раз хочу подчеркнуть, это стало фактически крупнейшим научным мероприятием по глобальной тематике и проблематике. А тематика, которая была вынесена на площадке Конгресса, она без сомнения реагировала, очень чутко реагировала на актуализированную глобальную повестку дня в области глобального развития международных отношений. Уважаемые коллеги, дорогие участники Международного научного конгресса «Глобалистика-2020», конечно, я хотел бы всем пожелать в эти дни очень успешной работы, очень плодотворного сотрудничества. Мы вот так соскучились по общению, по обмену мнениями, по обмену идеями. Тем более, действительно, человечество стоит перед новой глобальной проблемой, перед новой глобальной угрозой. Я бы хотел всей души пожелать не только успехов, но и крепкого здоровья. В наши дни это очень актуально и очень важно. Но самое главное – это сохранять и здравый смысл, бодрое настроение, оптимистический взгляд в будущее, несмотря на иногда мрачные прогнозы. И до скорой встречи, дорогие мои уважаемые, любимые участники, организаторы нашего общего дела, которое объединило нас, сплотило нас. И вот этот проект, конгресс «Глобалистика» стал очень знаковым, важным не только в научно-образовательном сообществе, но и в жизни каждого из нас. Желаю вам от всей души хорошего настроения, бодрого самочувствия и новых интеллектуальных побед. Спасибо за внимание. Так, дорогие коллеги, я присоединяюсь полностью к поздравлениям нашего декана Ильи Вячеславовича Ильина, я хочу от себя добавить, что то, что наш конгресс состоялся, это огромная заслуга именно нашего декана, который сумел настоять, чтобы конгресс прошел, прошел хотя бы в онлайн формате, потому что, как вы знаете, намечалось, что он пройдет в Москве, в Московском университете. Мы всех вас приглашали всех, ждали у себя, думали, что увидим вас лично э, за круглым столом, именно за круглым столом, как мы и намеревались сделать, обсудим проблемы общества и экономики 21 века и вызовов, которые стоят перед ними, но э, не получилось. Но то, что получилось, это хотя бы в таком формате, и это прекрасно, мы можем можем обсуждать эти темы. Правда, мы не сидим за круглым столом, но это не самое главное и не самое страшное. Главное, что мы можем говорить и обсуждать. Я передаю бразды правления пока что модератору, со-модератору нашего круглого стола, господину Куликову. Господин Куликов, пожалуйста, 
управляйте, я буду вам помогать. И цело иногда буду брать на себя, если это понадобится. Пожалуйста, начинаем. Коллеги, я прошу вас только перед каждым выступлением представляться, потому что не у всех на отмечены их имена и фамилии. Вот я вижу, что у кого-то есть, у кого-то нет. Это нам нужно для записи. Все записи у нас сохранятся, будут существовать они у нас в нашей библиотеке, чтобы каждый желающий, кого интересуют проблемы глобалистики, проблемы общества и экономики, их развития, могли бы всегда посмотреть наш круглый стол, и чтобы мы могли таким образом поделиться с ними нашими мудрыми мыслями. Я надеюсь, у нас все пройдет хорошо. Господин Куликов, пожалуйста. Александр, Thank you very much. It's uh, a pleasure. I will try to uh, spend a minute uh, to uh, not to uh, translate completely the welcoming words of the uh, Dean of the Faculty of Global Processes, uh, Professor Ilyin, uh, whose uh, words were very warm and very supportive, and very optimistic, and he said, and then Alexander Gasparishvili also uh, repeated it, that uh, since this is quite an old initiative, which uh, has been carried on for 10 years nowadays, uh, he uh, he's quite positive about the future development of this initiative, and uh, he thinks that in a year or two from now, we'll have uh, a chance for uh, online communication and offline communication both. And uh, I'm not going to uh, uh, translate it in, in every detail, but the idea is that the Congress has been working for 10 years now, and he, the Congress will be working next year and the year after. Like, let's say two years ago, the Congress was mostly uh, devoted to the idea of green economy. So possibly next year, some other topic uh, uh, will be proposed for uh, work, for uh, publication, and for uh, kind of sophisticated uh, cooperation between you, uh, dear friends, and uh, dear experts, and the Moscow State University. While uh, uh, our round table does not cover all the uh, problematic of the uh, Congress, we are kind of facilitating it and hopefully uh, will achieve some result. We are facilitating the idea of the Congress, the idea of uh, uh, peaceful cooperation, the idea of peaceful intellectual cooperation. And uh, uh, just one more remark, uh, for those who are not well, very well informed, uh, March this year, Moscow State University, uh, which I have been a student uh, in, in late 70s, has marked its 265th anniversary, which makes it, uh, which makes it uh, not only one of the oldest in Russia, but uh, which kind of uh, always was more devoted to the ideas of peace, progress, and critical thinking. Thank you very much. I uh, give the floor to Professor Alexander Akimov. Sorry, I will use uh, not the uh, names because we have seven Alexanders together and I will use the family name, okay? So it's gonna be Akimov. Yeah, just one Vladimir. Yes. Uh, uh, good. Uh, well, who is always kind of, you know, a troublemaker. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Professor Akimov, you need a presentation, correct? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Please uh, tell me when uh, you, will be need, you will need it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let's, let's get started. Uh -huh. Let's start, okay. Mm -hmm. Just a moment. 
Probably you'll start and I'll... Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, no, no, no. Okay. 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 That's it. That's it. Uh, dear colleagues, I hope the Faculty of Global Studies is the right place to make a provocative claim that global problems, as we call it in Russia, or limits to growth, as they are called uh, in English language, uh, are no longer a global phenomenon. Uh, the next slide, please. Next, oh, thank you. Uh, please have a look. Uh, the slide shows that problems uh, that are considered uh, to be global uh, since the early reports to the Club of Rome are uh, demographic, food, raw materials, power, and environment. And the main idea is that demographic growth and economic growth lead to resource scarcity and environmental degradation. And I insist that the situation changes greatly and uh, the global problems are no more, as uh, they are mentioned here, are no more global, they are local. They are localized in the region of South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, because the countries of these two regions are less equipped with new technology. My uh, second provocative statement is that the result of the fourth industrial revolution and the accumulation of labor and resource-saving technology uh, in the most technologically developed countries form a new system of productive forces. Uh, there is a traditional set of uh, production sectors, labor, capital, and natural resources. And now, the role of natural resources and human labor is significantly reduced. Now, thank you. Yeah. And the importance of technologies. No, no, no. Uh, the previous one, please. Uh -huh. Thank you. And um, just look at uh, this slide. What is this new system of productive forces? The base is the technologies of the fourth industrial revolution, but we should uh, we should include IT there. Why? Because we are a rather a source of um, the the IT mainly is for consumption, but not for production. It, uh, it, it is a means of control and production, but it, it doesn't make, IT doesn't make things. What is important? We should plus labor and resource saving technologies of the previous period. They are mm, there, some of them. See, uh, there are some technologies which are very important for uh, modern industry, for modern production technologies, but they have nothing to do with the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, for instance, uh, there is such a technology, such uh, production complexes, as crushing units in mining. Uh, crushing units are huge machines that we just rotate and move soil and coal and all and so on and so forth. They have nothing to do with information technology, but they remove, but they remove uh, human labor from mining. Uh, so, Oh, I, I, I suppose it's clear what is what is on the slide. So let's go, let's go on and please. Uh, thank you.
There are two items in the two features of the new system of production forces. Uh, resource saving part of this new system of production forces uh, removed the severity of global problems or limits to growth. But the second side, labor saving, has both positive and negative components. The positive side is the solving of problems of the labor shortage in the aging population. Aging population uh, is a real global problem. And uh, it is solved by uh, those labor saving technologies. Uh, the other benefit of uh, this new system of, product, of productive forces is the improving of quality of product because uh, human participation, human labor participation is minimal. And now the third statement, which I want to present. These, uh, there are new problems which are initiated by the new productive forces. These new problems are potentially very active and may take the place of global problems, both in scale, uh, in scope and in significance. The main problem is what should people do with the further development of labor saving technology? I should say that the coronavirus has set up a big social experiment. Many people don't work, but life support doesn't stop them. The fact is that it is provided by labor saving technologies in agriculture, energy, and transport. A small number of people provide for the existence of many. And there are two already clearly defined trends the increase of property inequality, which uh, somatically key no, and the development of labor saving technology. Let's just imagine uh, that they are developing for a couple of decades. And then we can identify two main scenarios for social and economic development. Please, the next slide. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, these are the names, and so I comment of, you know, of what is uh, the uh, idea of each scenario. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, the new Rome scenario is an analog of ancient Rome. Uh, this shows the social system of ancient Rome has been existing for many centuries. So, uh, just, uh, remo just remove slaves and you may have the analog of the stable social system. Next slide, please. A communist by Karl Marx. Uh, contrary to the previous scenario, uh, I can't present you any real example of the uh, scenario in life. But this model can be um, maybe um, classified as the ideal model, but it is quite possible as a social democratic project. Besides, 
they say it's no ground the uh, Islamic world. So next slide, please. Anti-utopia or dystopia. Now that's the worst what can happen. But unfortunately, I can present you some examples of this scenario uh, in the history of the 20th century. Uh, I hope um, they be clear. The next slide, please. So cheap labor in the service sector. Uh, the, this scenario is a free market option. This is the development of free labor market in a competitive environment. In the previous uh, scenarios, the market is excluded and uh, resources are distributed by the state. Uh, this set of scenarios illustrate uh, the kind of problems that the new system of productive forces can create. There are very many new challenges besides uh, these scenarios, uh, but they are shaping a new global process. How do we work with them? How can we uh, manage uh, these problems, these challenges? Uh, here is it is a proprietary poll that the role of the Club of Rome was really great in solving global problems or limits to growth. It was uh, the, this institute called the Club of Rome that initiated a broad discussion of the problems identified in the first report, in the first report to the Club of Rome. Uh, it seems to me that the Department of Global Studies, the Department of Global Studies, will probably become the center for research of this issue. But I would like to draw your attention to the capabilities of the International Institute for Economic and Social Studies in Vienna. Now, this is an international structure, international institute, that is independent, but has strong links with the communities of many countries. It seems that yeah. expert discussion and forecast within this institute would be useful in analyzing all the new global problems. Thank you for your time. I hope. I, I said something that is not that is interesting, not only for me. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you very much. Большое спасибо, Александр. Очень сконцентрированное и очень очень яркое выступление с далеко идущими возможностями для работы. Thank you very much. May I say, uh, Vladimir? May I say to you, uh, Alexander? Uh, Thank you so much for your presentation. I, I believe it will be very valuable uh, for our faculty. And if you don't mind, I would like to include your presentation in the teaching materials for our students. Thank you. Okay. Great. So uh, everything appreciated immediately. One doesn't have to. One doesn't have to add warm words. Большое спасибо, все мгновенно воспринято, все мгновенно как на производстве уходит в работу. I had, uh, I had uh, a message from Oksana uh, Gamangalutvina, a professor from GIMO. She asks for a 15-minute delay. Uh, how, are you ready to replace her in this uh, time slot? Uh, I... 
sure. Are you ready for uh, Did your we have presentation? Asked me? Yes, sure. Sure. Okay, I can do it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Спасибо большое. Я попросил профессора Рица заменить Оксану Викторовну Гаман Голодвину, потому что она просит 15-минутный отсрочку. Okay. Thank you very much for the honor to speak at this conference. <coughs> um, I'm a publicist and a lecturer at the University of Gießen. Um, I wrote my doctoral in philosophy and I'm also trying to understand the, the foreign policy of our time, especially the new Cold War from a philosophical and cultural perspective. Yeah, my when I received several months ago the invitation for this conference, I really couldn't imagine um, that it would take in such a format. It is really a testimony to the geopolitical shift and historical shift which we are witnessing today. Uh, there are several trends in today's world uh, which are really concerning. We have the ongoing rise of China and East Asia, and in the same time, a nearly constant decline of the West. And it's really um, uh, difficult to imagine that this could continue in a peaceful manner. At the same time, we have a set of new technology on the horizon of history. Uh, technologies like artificial intelligence, uh, data mining, 5G, genetic engineering, and uh, what is really concerning about those technologies is that their implementation seems to undermine uh, uh, the humanistic foundation of European civilization. And uh, from, from my perspective, Russia is a part of those European civilization, even though it has some independence, uh, cultural independence. Um, and uh, the third trend that is really concerning is that we have at the same time a dramatic concentration of wealth. Uh, during the virus crisis in the United States, um, American oligarchs like Bill Gates and Bloomberg openly acted as if they were state institutions. And just recently uh, made the news the headline that the head of Amazon, um, Jeff Bezos, will be six years from now the first trillionaire in human history. And it doesn't matter if you are political on the left side or on the right side. Uh, I think everybody understands that such a concentration of wealth is a problem for the political system, for the civilization as a whole. And uh, that there is the danger that if this wealth concentration continues, that we may head it towards a new feudal order. And if you combine this perspective, with rise of will the of a kind of surveillance, then we are uh, really a reason to feel we are moving towards the future. And um, I'd like to raise if there are are there are forces in our world today which could the process to which direction. And to mind is, of course, that the Western world and the rise of the Eastern world will probably create room for different civilizations. That, for example, there could rise an Asian or Eurasian civilization could do things a little bit different, so that they. Sandra, I'm, I'm sorry. Can, can, can you uh, uh, can you put your earphones on because there are some problems not with, with the video but the quality of. Uh, Voice translation, just okay. okay. My, my earphone is fantastic. It's very interesting, very provocative, but there are some problems with with the uh, voice so, translation. So, uh, yeah. So I will do it. Um. So, uh, do you hear me now? Perfect. Fantastic. Perfect. We can't fantastic. see you at the moment, but but we hear you perfect. Uh, yeah. Um, so the, the problem uh, that, um, so there could be the one solution to the problem is that there's a second model of civilization arising at the, uh, beside the Western world, which could do things different. But in recent time, I have become more pessimistic towards this solution, because if we look at modern China, which would be the leader of such a new civilization, um, uh, the desire for technology, the admiration for technological solution is in China as strong as in the United States. Therefore, 
they, they may be uh, heading to a similar path. Um, the second model is, uh, the second solution could be that there is a strong social movement in the Western world or in Europe in general, um, which would, uh, could address those problems. The problem with this solution is that the left forces uh, in the society who usually have the task to do such things, uh, they have been changed during the Cold War. Uh, the, today's left is much different than the left uh, 100 years ago. Uh, there was a shift of issues during the Cold War away from the social question towards postmodern values and issues like um, um, uh, minority rights, feminism, environment issues, uh, uh, climate change, and so forth. And uh, the, these kind of left uh, is relatively corrupted, to, to say the least. And um, they have also become a part of the ideological system of the today's Western world, and therefore it is unlikely they, they, that they will be able to present a solution for the problems of civilization of our time. And this um, brings me to the third possibility, to the third force that could make a difference. And this is a question if there are conservative groups and conservative critics who could address um, the problem of culture, because uh, this dystopian future to which we are heading is also a problem of culture. Uh, in the last half century, European culture has become more and more nihilistic. It has lost its sense for beauty. It has um, uh, lost its sense for the spiritual dimension of a human life. And maybe uh, 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 a new cultural force, conservative critics in, in Europe, could try to um, translate some of the older features of European culture into our time, give it a modern form, so that we can uh, regain some of the cultural complexity European culture once had. And uh, there are actually four elements of European culture of the Age of Enlightenment, which could maybe translate it into a modern form and resurrect it. There is, for example, during the Age of Enlightenment, during the 18th and 19th century, and even in the early 20th century, European culture was much, uh, had a, a great awareness for history and historical processes. This was uh, the result of the secularization of Christianity, which believed in salvation history. And this was secularized in the Age of Enlightenment into the belief in progress and the, the belief that, that uh, uh, mankind can rule its own historical process. If we could uh, regain some of this awareness, maybe we could lead history in the right direction. The second thing that was very important uh, in the past uh, European culture um, was uh, the awareness for the question, um, uh, was the awareness for the uh, fact that human beings are consciousness beings. The human mind was uh, a kind of mystery during the Age of Enlightenment. Uh, there were a lot of philosophy, a lot of books, of literature, who addressed the riddle of human consciousness. And in the last 50 years, our culture has turned away from this question, turned away from the question of freedom and, and reason, and uh, uh, started to be concentrated on, on the body and, and on issues like sexuality and so forth. And so we have lost the sense that uh, being human means first and foremost to, to be consciousness. If we could change our culture in such a direction that this becomes once again the main feature of European culture, then I think we could guide uh, the historical processes in a more meaningful direction. And the third thing of the past uh, culture of Europe, which could maybe be renewed, is that during the 18th and 19th and early 20th century, there was great admiration for artists, for writers, for philosophers, poets, composers, and painters. And um, at that time, those highly developed individuals like Goethe, Pushkin, Dostoevsky, Mozart, um, they gave an example, a testimony, what can a human being achieve, what it really means to be human. And if we could regain some of this perception, some of this awareness again, and would be able to establish a culture that, a culture that is once again able for admiration of, of high examples of the to address the problem technologies, of the geopolitical confrontation, um, uh, and the wealth concentration. 
And uh, finally, the traditional European culture that existed for several hundred years uh, was based on a dualistic understanding of reality. Yes, there was a progress of natural science, um, but it was combined with a second uh, realm, uh, literature, philosophy. So there was always uh, the understanding that matter is not everything, that there's also a spiritual, mental dimension to human life. Uh, while in the last 50 years we have lost this, uh, we have gained the worldview that uh, human is only um, an, a natural, uh, a higher developed animal and uh, uh, that uh, everything is matter and everything can be discovered by natural science. Uh, so if we could restore our culture, widen the horizon once again, and uh, then I think uh, we could escape the nihilistic culture, uh, cultural trends of the last 50 years. And this was, would enable us to solve the political and social and civilizational problems we currently have. And uh, I would like to emphasize that I think that for this cultural renewal, uh, this cultural resurrection of European culture, which, which is very essential, very important, that there the Eastern Europe, especially Russia, has to play an important role because uh, the interpretation of European culture from an American viewpoint is extremely strong in Western Europe because America is there present for 70 and more years. And if uh, it comes to Eastern Europe, to those countries who were formerly socialist countries, they have uh, a deeper connection to the traditional European culture nowadays. And maybe they uh, can play a positive role in this cultural shift that is essential for our future. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much for the interesting presentation. And Vladimir. I'm, I'm trying to uh, get a mess, to get a confirmation from Oksana that she's ready to start in, in five minutes. But she needed 15 minutes, correct? Uh, yeah. What I'm saying is that uh, she will be ready in five minutes. And uh, if you are not against it, I would propose that we... Uh, kind of uh, make a very small uh, summary of the first two reports. Uh, if you please, my vision is that uh, both reports uh, sh kind of underline the possibility of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, short but very uh, well organized study of what can be done in let's say 10 years to come to initiate different uh, kind of uh, uh, research, uh, maybe coordinated by the Moscow State University, maybe coordinated by let's say the goodwill of the expert society. But the first two reports show, in, in my humble opinion, uh, the necessity to either formulate the positive perspective or the negative perspective, but don't make it a kind of dual uh, perspective, because dual perspective seems to be less, uh, uh, let's say, uh, relevant to what really is happening uh, to what really is happening uh, in our minds I think so uh, don't I think that uh, black and white perspective is not working the uh, some perspective that might be uh, shared by uh, a larger number of experts could encompass different analysis, uh, either based on personal experiences or based on certain methodology of, let's say, 10-year uh, 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 perspective. I mean, I'm sorry for my English. I'm sorry for the way I, I, I uh, kind of formulate things. Uh, I have a message from Aksana, which saved me. Alexander Gasperishvili, would you be so kind to let uh, Aksana in? Yes, sure. I cannot see her among those who need to. 
Has she applied? No, she hasn't yet. Uh, Let's move on. Okay, so you uh, happy to okay. see here. Okay, she will, she will get in. Then let me then present uh, uh, my small uh, personal uh, remarks on uh, on the uh, what is the what is the Institute of. Uh, International studies in Vienna that I represent. Let me make a, a couple of quotes and uh, some, uh, I wouldn't say ideas, but some proposals for further uh, research that we kind of, uh, we kind of started uh, with your kind support and uh, with kind support of Moscow State University, which, which also took some notice of us, although most of us has graduated from a uh, 20, 30 years ago. So uh, my proposal, or let's say my paper, is about the concept of complex society as the basis for a pragmatic analysis of political process in uh, developing countries. Uh, Professor Gasparishvili, uh, 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 Aksana can't get in. I have. Yes, but I cannot uh, see her. I'd love to let her in, but uh, where is she? Okay, so... Uh, then I think this problem will be settled sometime. Uh, I'm not going to say many words about our institution because uh, we have uh, uh, Dr. Walter Schwimmer who will be hopefully saying some words about it and Alexander Akimov, thank you to him, also introduced uh, the, uh, uh, this project to your kind attention. The only thing I would say that uh, about this institute, at least how I see it, uh, is that uh, the Institute is an example of uh, a continental thinking. If we, if, if we read uh, French historiography, continental thinking is uh, something else. So uh, uh, in pan-European intellectual space, uh, we call it alternative, which means innovative and promising. So I have to, I have to explain. What, why are we why are we trying to uh, to uh, stimulate the research of people from different experts uh, uh, highly esteemed experts from different uh, uh, organizations so uh, the long term goal of the organization is to prepare promote and publish research in order to develop a more balanced model for the development of the complex socio economic structures of european and eurasian region to test and approve the arguments of experts on current and promising socio-economic processes, as well as to ensure the participation of representatives of non-hegemonistic powers in the nomination of alternative scenarios of the future in the above processes. I'm sorry for being a bit too philosophical. Regardless of the political role of specific experts, IISIS research is professional and statistically verifiable. If you are interested, you can have a look at our uh, 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 re first uh, report three years back. It's about it's about statistics. It's about uh, it's it's uh, Alexander. She can't get in. Okay, it's it's about a necessity to use. Uh, statistics that can be verified or, or not to use them at all because all, all legal entities have their all countries have their own statistics. Uh, some time ago in uh, a couple of years ago we have initiated uh, a small in independent intellectual platform which we called EIR Euro India Russia which has, by the intention of the initiators, joined other entities in a groundwork for an alternative or a broader way that would better account for historical experience, human resources, and social capital, capital of uh, countries in Euro-Asia, Euro-Asia, not Eurasia, that it has been doing up until now. And we are happy to have you all uh, participating in, in, in this uh, effort. Uh, most of our 
associate researchers has been supportive from early 2000s to the idea of initiation of then very popular World Public Forum Dialogue of Civilizations, which from the first session in 2003 has outlined two main global issues that should have been solved for a perspective of uh, world development by a possible global effort. It remains to be seen whether this task has been achieved. So these two uh, issues were the issue of enclosure and the issue of introduction of modern sets of secularized technologies. As we all might be witnessing, both issues have not been solved up to the moment. And in our view, this has led to the current wave of disintegrational processes. But it doesn't mean that these issues might not be solved by, let's say, small local communities if big actors or big powers fail to do so. Just one qu quote from uh, Professor Jan Bremen, who was one of those who initiated the forum in 2003. At first session, he stated that exclusion is certainly not of recent origin and cannot only be related to acceleration of the process of globalization during the last quarter of a century. There are various dimensions to exclusion which do not necessarily overlap. In an economic sense, exclusion refers to inability to be engaged in gainful employment which yields enough income for satisfying basic requirements. In political terms, exclusion implies lack of access to sources of power, the inability to participate meaningfully in decision-making processes from the household levels upwards. Uh, in a social sense, exclusion is equal to disintegration, the loss of respectability and dignity in the eyes of self as well as the others. That's a big point quote from Professor Jan Bremen of that time. And uh, another uh, quote from uh, Hans-Peter Dur, who at that time was the director of Werner Heinesberg Institute. Unfortunately, he passed away, but, but he kind of uh, stressed the importance uh, of what uh, Dr. Hauke has been saying today already. The impressive advances of the natural sciences reinforced the hope, cherished especially during the Enlightenment, that in the end and in principle, everything in the world might be accessible to human knowledge, so far only evades our rational insights because of its greater complexity. So you see that uh, the, the great complexity does not mean that uh, uh, it can't be summarized in a proper way, and if not sold by the big governments or the big power struggle, then it might be sold by a small group of researchers, uh, and uh, uh, that will solve it on the local uh, on the local level, not necessarily on the global level. Uh, having said that, as an appreciation of great minds of our current global history. I would turn to the topic of my presentation, which deals with the importance of a notion of a complex society, whether national or international, in search for the big answers to the big questions, which in my humble opinion is more than important for studies of possible future transformational scenarios and scientific globalistics. First, I will make three points. First, should we plan our future and still share our ideas internationally and locally in a defragmenting world structural environment and the post-pandemic reality? Might and should we invite some research in the world uh, about the world, uh, about the shape of the world, which will most possibly happen in 10 years from now, not necessarily waiting for the UN set goals for 2040, can we do something uh, before it? Can we do something to 2030? My personal answer is yes, we should if our mission is to facilitate responsible statesmanship. Uh, Professor Akimov uh, has touched upon this issue in his presentation about, 
about the prospective scenarios uh, of the productive forces development in the so-called developing countries, which fully adheres to the purpose of IIS studies and research and its attempts to stimulate this discussion of these issues. Because even the notion of developing countries is, is kind of, you know, uh, tricky stuff. Uh, some experts also name these countries, I mean the developing ones, as a late start countries from the perspective of their emergence and active participation in current globalization practices. Their start were late, so they kind of uh, try to find uh, their place, but not allowed to in, in the way they want to. While this term can also be a productive for description of the uh, developmental goals of a new normative globalized world, uh, remains to be seen, but, but possibly uh, a better explanation of what is development in, in, in uh, present uh, global civilization and what is not. It also remains uh, an interesting subject of research. From the pragmatic point of view, Russia, Vietnam, or India, or even China, and many others might be attributed to the category, category of late start countries while enjoying themselves hundreds of even thousands of years of their authentic evolution as cultures, civilizations, or, or countries, and active relations with other cultures, civilizations, and countries, both neighboring and situated quite distant from them. So that, that's possibly, uh, possibly some way to solve the uh, ineffectiveness of uh, let's say global or, or super global uh, calculations of, of possible world wars. Second, the current COVID-19 epidemic in our view should not overshadow the fact that the structural global economic crisis which has occurred in 2008 mainly on global periphery at that time returned this year in a new and a deeper form. I can uh, quote uh, uh, a very respectable and influential Institute of Economic Forecasting of the Russian Academy of Sciences, which specializes in fundamental applied and exploratory scientific research in the field of analysis and forecasting of the socioeconomic prospects. Uh, but I'm not going to, to make a big quote. The, uh, the position is quite, uh, is quite straight. The scale of shocks happening in the world and Russian economy allows experts to consider the current crisis not as an economic phenomenon, but rather as a social one. It's a, it's, it's, it's a social uh, uh, crisis, not, uh, not necessarily an economic crisis or, or uh, like it used to be some 10 years ago. Third, trying to make another impulse for better understanding of European and Eurasian realities for the people outside of these regions, I would propose after Alexander Akimov's uh, presentation, and we've been in contact a lot for very many years, I would propose an option, a notion of new locality that might be productive for experts who explore the perspective and challenges which may not be in the mainstream discourse, but nevertheless greatly affect our future. I mean, we, 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 our great symbolic but pathetic definitions like globalization or regionalization uh, made many experts start thinking and superficially taking, talking about global and regional processes, possible implications, migration flows, mobility, tolerance, and many changes to the way that they saw the world before. And uh, it has, in my humble opinion, created a wave of populist interpretations and commentaries whose influence on the public and intellectual discourse might be qualified as not very productive. From my perspective, while the elitist discourse still maintains the need for new formats of integration or other examples of big thinking or big narrative thinking or even Inventing new narratives, the intellectual trends on the grassroots level is characterized by opposing vectors. What one would experience while interacting in his social groups 
looks more like individualization or critical assimilation. And acceptance of these assumptions might be quite productive productive for improving both the knowledge of experts as well as a public discourse. And uh, my last remark, finally, I would dare to propose that more effort might be put in bringing more knowledge about different online distant educational programs and historically proven achievements, and not only by the big and central universities like Moscow State University or big European universities, but smaller ones, not necessarily as big as the huge universities. Uh, as just reported by uh, BBC, there will be no face-to-face -face lectures in the next academic years due, due to coronavirus, as stated by Cambridge University. Then why shouldn't we think of inviting much smaller uh, schools, universities, and, and groups uh, that could use this time for the purpose of, uh, let's say, uh, making their recommendations for uh, a better and more humanistic world order. Thank you very much for your time. I'm trying to send. I'm trying to send the link to uh, uh, Oksana again because she can't uh, get in. Alexander Fergusevich, was microphone you включил? Uh, dear colleagues, I'm sorry. The microphone was turned off. Sorry, Vladimir, uh, you can see from your email, I sent you a print screen that... Uh, she's not, she's not uh, if is, you're talking, sorry about Oksana, she, she she's does... She's not uh, in, but anyhow, we are much she, who's beyond... Who's in the wrong link? link. Sure, maybe. Yes, anyhow, we are beyond the time. And, okay. And I think that the reason is because we do not try to comply with our uh, okay. requirements. So uh, how about the break that, that we had to have? Because I need the time to download some uh, presentations which our participants sent to me. Okay. How about five minutes break? Do you agree? Everybody <laughs> agree with this idea? So please turn on your microphones and, uh, and videos. So, and now it's, uh, so in five minutes, we'll start again.
Walter, do you hear me? Umayu. Okay. Uh, Walter, this is Vladimir Kulikov. Okay. Will you be ready to take the floor first? Yes, I am. Perfect. Then I have, I think we'll, we'll, we'll need another three or five minutes to restore the order and to get used to, to uh, this Zoom translations, uh, Zoom communication, which we are frankly not very much keen at. There are people sending, there are people sending uh, different reports uh, and uh, the organizational work is not stopping and we will be available. Uh, we will be, uh, we will have a chance to read them through both in summaries and in full text, if, if you prefer. I can organize them and send uh, all 17 presentations to you if, if you want to. And there is some, uh, there is some, uh, let's say, uh, there are some ideas inside that might be uh, fruitful for the development of, of the Institute, whatever you say. Ну что, может быть, когда начнем, или еще пять минут не прошло? Я-то готов, Вальтер готов, я думаю, что... Ну, смотри, а, пришла Оксана Галтуна принять, все, появилась. У нее, видно, ну, была что? неправильная ссылка. Может быть, мы начнем все-таки с Вальтера, я ему предложу, а потом мы, да, конечно, мы пойдем начнем. дальше вместо Тиберио Грациани, попросим Леонида Марковича выступить, да. Александра Дубового, если... Наш уважаемый чешский коллега присоединится. Я пока не вижу, чтобы он присоединился. Он прислал мне текст на чешском. То мы тогда Оксану Викторовну попросим где-то в районе 14 присоединиться, если ей это удобно. Я думаю, что... Да, да. да. Оксана Викторовна, здрасте. Здравствуйте. Я про... Здравствуйте, Я прошу... Оксана Викторовна. Здравствуйте. Здравствуйте. Очень рад при... вас видеть. Взаимно. Приношу извинения. По техническим причинам смогла присоединиться только сейчас. Да, то мы очень волновались, думали, что что-то со связью, потому нет, что нет. я не видел, наконец нашли, увидели, все теперь. Да, мы... вы знаете, к сожалению, не сразу удалось войти, какие-то сложности технические были, ну, главное, что все позади, все позади. Да. Я, я пыталась, правда, войти через, ну, не буду отвлекать техническими сложностями, все, я уже на месте, я в порядке. Вы имеете двух ваших верных слуг в том смысле, что мы и техническую часть осуществляем тоже сами, поскольку как-то передоверять студентам пробовали, но это еще, еще хуже. Поэтому... Нет, 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 это бывает. Обычно у нас студенты очень надежные, очень хорошо, у нас все прекрасно всегда со студентами, но все-таки мы решили полагаться только на себя, доверить себя, так сказать, это, говоря английским языком, и челлендж. Как вот это у нас mm -hmm. пойдет? Кстати, то, что, целом, все, что мы да. сейчас говорим, это, между прочим, идет сейчас прямую трансляцию. У нас сейчас транслируют все наше выступление на сайте Globalistica.ru. Сейчас можно прямо нас смотреть, если что, и как мы даже обсуждаем наши текущие вопросы. Мне все кажется, ходы записаны, как говорил. Все так и есть. Правильно. Кстати, в этом есть тоже интерес. Видно, что у нас идет живое обсуждение. Я думаю, что пять минут истекли, и мы можем вполне начинать нашу беседу, наш круглый стол. Да, и... Владимир, I think it's time to give the floor to uh, Dr. Schwimmer. Walter? Yes. Walter, Please. We can't see you, but we hear you. We. Uh, I put the video on. You should. See, you should be able to. We see. we see you and we can hear you. We are waiting for you. So, okay. Walter, please. Fine. Thank you very much. We give you the uh, floor and uh, please. 
Proceed. share, share uh, your opinion with us. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to express my gratitude to Vladimir Kuriko, uh, who did so much to make this round table within this uh, globalistics conference possible and brought together this very distinguished round of people um, we are listening to at the moment. Vladimir is not only the brain of the International Institute for Social and Economic Studies, but he's also the heart and the soul of this institution. Um, and I'm really grateful to him, what he has done. Um, but for ISIS, um, ISIS is thought to be uh, the answer to the main challenges to our civilization. And uh, with Vladimir's help, we put together a network of scientists and of experts to give the answers to this question. Um, but turning to the topic I should speak about um, in this round table, the European Concord, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Um, when we talk about Europe, we talk about the empire, the whole Europe. This is not only because we are now in the framework of a conference of the Moscow State University. Um, no, it's my deep conviction that we must take care of the whole of Europe. Um, Europe is too small to be divided. Um, I just recently found the estimation of the United Nations of the development of uh, population until 2030. Um, the estimation for the world population is about 8.5 billion people living on this globe. And Europe, including Russia, has less than 10% of this number. So we need, if we want that Europe plays a specific role in the world, we need all Europeans, we need all of Europe, and we need Russia in particular. Um, and we have to find the way how this Europe will look like. Um, secondly, um, I want to talk about the vision we are missing for Europe. Uh, the founding fathers of the European institutions, uh, Council of Europe, uh, European Union, developed their ideas during the Second World War, when they were banned from politics and had time to, to think about the vision. Um, how could Europe look like after the devastating World War, after the atrocities that happened uh, in Europe, and, and they succeeded. Um, they succeeded to have a vision of United Europe as a peace project. And this, this, thing, this, still, this is still valid. Members of the can you turn off your mic, Deepak? Whatever I uh, impact, please uh, turn on uh, turn off your microphone. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Deepak, please turn off your microphone. He already did. It. Okay. Well, that's all. Can I speak now again? Yes, sure. sir. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, um, the European project has been a peace project, and it succeeded so far, but. Um, for too many people, peace in Europe is self-evident. Uh, the, the wars um, are far behind of us. Um, and for, even for my sons, the Second World War is like the Napoleonic Wars. Um, but I think it's still necessary to emphasize that Europe is a peace project. And for this peace project, we need the whole of Europe. Um, When in 1989, 1990, uh, Europe changed uh, and uh, there was a chance that the whole of Europe will be a democratic one, a peaceful one. Um, one missed to establish a vision and a strategy how to deal with the largest European country, with Russia. Um, immediately, after the change, 
when Russia, and after the collapse of the Soviet Union, when Russia was in economic troubles, European Union in particular used to patronize Russia, uh, which was of course a big mistake. And those who were in favor of patronizing Russia um, were not able to cope with the new situation when Russia's economy recovered and Russia started again to play an important role in the world order and in the European order in particular. Um, if you look to, this, to the relation of uh, European Union with Russia, um, there was the idea of a strategic partnership, but it was never really implemented, never. Um, there was only one practical approach. It was in the new Russia summit in St. Petersburg, in, I think it was in 2003, um, when they developed four common spaces. Sorry, dear colleagues, sorry, please, technical uh, problems. Uh, dear colleagues, please turn off your microphones. But not all of them, but but the one only leave one on for those who is uh, really who is who, who is speaking, please. Okay, now it's a turn again to me. Um, so um, when there was a real crisis between okay. Europe and Russia, um, in 2014. Здравствуйте, господин Валтер. Помните на родосі наші встречі з Еманом і що пензіонером? Добрий день. I am sorry, please. Uh, Dr. Schreiber is speaking now. Please don't interrupt him. Sorry. Okay. Um, when... Sorry, Dr. Schreiber. Uh, please. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, in 2014, there arose a real conflict, a real problem between European Union and Russia. It was because of the uh, conflicts in East Ukraine and in Crimea. And at this time, there was the last EU-Russia summit uh, in 2014. Uh, and it was already overshadowed by the Ukrainian crisis. Can you imagine, there was one tool to solve common problems. There was one tool to discuss common problems. That was the EU-Russia summit. And that was not used anymore. The same applies to the NATO-Russia council. It was suspended by, by NATO. So one missed the opportunity to have a real dialogue, a real political platform. Um, there was only one event which gives little hope to me, a glimpse of hope. Uh, that was <clears throat> the Minsk Declaration of 2015, of 12th of February. In this Minsk Declaration, the three presidents and one chancellor want Putin Merkel Poroshenko declared that they are committed, they are still committed to the vision of a humanitarian and economic space from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And this is a vision which is close to my heart, which I followed during my time as Secretary General of the Council of Europe. And I think we have to revive that. We have to come back to this vision of European cooperation, of European spirit uh, to extend the peace project to the whole of the continent. 
uh, this is my, my view important. And we have to discuss um, what is the role of Europe in the new world order. Um, the world has changed dramatically and substantially since 1989-1990. New forces were imagined. Um, can you imagine that if the Council, if the United Nations organization would create it now, not in 1945, would there be any more three seats, three permanent seats out of five given to European countries? I don't think so, uh, because uh, the, the center of power have moved and um, we have to take it into account and to make the European way of life strong, we are not the strongest military power. And maybe in 2013, we will not be any more uh, the greatest economy. Maybe we are still the great Europe, the whole of Europe, uh, but maybe we are not anymore the strongest economy. But I think we have to contribute to permanent peace on this globe a lot with our cultural identity, with um, the spirit of a peaceful Europe, and that is is worth to to fight for. And I think uh, the ISIS um, can do a lot uh, to strengthen uh, this vision. And I would like to invite all of you to participate. Thank you. Thank you very much, for Professor. Schwimmer, thank you very much for your presentation and for invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we have uh, Leonid Grigoriev. If, if he is ready, we'll be happy to listen to his presentation. Which yes, please. yes. Okay. Thank you very much. I am uh, starting my own timer to make it in 10 minutes. Great. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation for this interesting event. Uh, I feel myself uh, like economist among mostly political uh, sciences uh, professors. Uh, the economists, nor economists normally criticize elites in this, in, in this situation. And I will start uh, with very simple an observation that we are sitting online on the Easter Island uh, and discussing what is going to be after the uh, pandemic of coronavirus. The whole Moscow, the whole world is discussing what will be after. We still, before the, uh, any sign of the end of the pandemic. And I'm uh, working very closely uh, on this side. Uh, my, my topic today is very ambitious, but it's possible to make short. Um, let me remind that uh, climate, Paris Climate uh, Change Prevention Agreement and CDG, uh, both were signed in 2015. It was actually inertia after some period after the uh, crisis of 2008 and 9 was behind us, and most of sanctions were just beginning. So it was the last uh, glimpse uh, of cooperation. So both agreements were signed uh, with intentions to do something serious about it. Uh, as economists, let me assure you that uh, practically nothing can be done on a major scale. There are a lot of small uh, um, reasonable improvements here and there, but we are not, we haven't made any serious steps ahead in CDG and in climate change prevention. Uh, I am part of the process of uh, producing, I'm part of the um, only Russian big forecast for 2040 on energy and climate uh, in working closely with it, not, not only on climate change. Uh, I would touch upon uh, let's say four points, uh, climate, infrastructure, inequality, and something else, um, doesn't matter, I will go by, by CDGs. Uh, uh, so practically, uh, destruction 
or dissolution or disbanding of global governance uh, is obvious. Uh, and pandemic came uh, at a very inconvenient moment for cooperation to fight it. It's the first pandemic we are fighting, consciously because Spanish flu was actually during the war and nobody uh, resisted. Well, we are, the only good news was um, that uh, pandemic and stoppage of the uh, consumption uh, came not at the end of the upturn, not at the time of a, a normal economic crisis, but somewhat before. Uh, but it's, the, the <laughs> it's a very little for uh, assurance. Uh, uh, and uh, what we observe now in the world of accusing each other on how it started, how we monitor it, how we count, count the graves, how we, uh, what we are doing about vaccines, what we are doing about treating, what we are doing later, is a very bad sign uh, on the future cooperation on everything. So global problems actually are in danger. Uh, now I'm, I will go by very briefly by each of, or by some of the uh, uh, 17 CDGs, uh, just to make it obvious. First, on poverty, we probably made a huge step back, not only on CDG, but we probably by uh, poverty made a step back to the beginning of the millennium goals, because we have probably half a million, half a billion poor people this year because of recession and coronavirus. And we pro, in, by 2040, we will have two more billion people, one of them in Africa, and probably number of poor people by the criteria, meager criteria, 1.9 dollars per head a day. We probably, uh, we are probably back to 2,000. Uh, hunger attached, uh, health. Health is obvious. Everybody saw the difference between how works the European system of health, how is Anglo-Saxon, Brazil included, and out of a sudden, as uh, Alexander Rar mentioned once, now, why is the European countries are uh, not experiencing that much of the trouble? And as far as my students writing course works on Germany, reporting me that in DDR uh, regions, uh, coronavirus is much more lower than uh, Federal Republic regions. So we have interesting uh, <laughs> consequences of the dead socialist system, but still something is working in the healthcare. Uh, energy and climate. Uh, this year we will have interesting experiment uh, on how it looks like we wrote in which rich people don't spend too much gasoline and kerosene on aviation because April numbers are minus 15 uh, um, million barrels a day in gasoline, in minus 5 million barrels a day uh, to give a 20% of the output of 100 uh, million, and five, minus 5 or maybe more uh, million uh, barrels a day of kerosene for aviation, because by 30th of uh, March, it was only 60,000 flights a day out of 180,000 in January. Uh, now is less. Uh, so we have a lifestyle. Now we're going to uh, CDG 10 to inequality. We have inter absolutely outstanding experiment this year, because all the bans on the recreation, on the restaurants, on travels uh, and on other entertainment, sport and everything. It's mostly the ban on the consumption of the fifth quintile, mostly. So rich people are prevented from spending money. Of course, poor are suffering. It's not about it. Uh, so from the point of view of demand for consumption, uh, it's down with demand, well, actually consumption of the rich strata. Uh, it means we have some delayed demand, not too much, but they have delay, we have savings. Uh, so poor going down, rich, well, let it be one trillionaire. The problem is the fifth quintile all around the world, Russia included, 
basically not spending money. I am sitting here. Uh, we are not buying shorts. We are not buying cars. We are not going to rest and we are not flying to Maldives. Uh, the recovery from this recession will be dependent on Gabonism of a fifth quintile. If rich people will go to spend, we will have recovery. If they will, wouldn't go, we will not have a recovery. Or at least uh, some speed of a recovery will be affected by how rich people coming out of the quarantine. Uh, so we have technically, technically less inequality in consumption at the moment. But actually out of a recession, a rich strata will come more rich, relatively to poor, because poor are spending, spending uh, savings. Rich people are stockpiling savings. Uh, that's, so nothing like 10th uh, CDG between countries well. We don't, we don't have effect of solo. We don't have effect of Kuznets, um, uh, no, no umbrella. Uh, uh, institutions, of course, institutions is a problem. And finally, since probably uh, I don't see uh, my, uh, but somebody will help me. Uh, and finally, uh, on 17th CDG, on partnership, and so on and so on. What partnership? Uh, we are surviving uh, mostly alone, how we can. Now we will have next issues. First, trust of numbers because uh, all these numbers are important because if we don't trust numbers, we don't trust uh, if country uh, became clean of coronavirus or not. It's, it will be important for aviation, for uh, recreation, for transportation. Uh, few, uh, few regions of Europe may call, I call it white spots or clean spots. We may make an agreement uh, like a travel balloon between uh, Australia and New Zealand. But actually, it's, ah, that's my, uh, it works. So uh, just a few words. Uh, the, what is very important to prevent the elites fight on vaccines and trust. Otherwise, we will not get out of the mess. Uh, we need to establish a mechanism of recognizing treatments, uh, tests, who is clean, and uh, all, all the rules of, for transportation. Otherwise, you will be waiting for not two hours uh, to make sure that you are not carrying the bomb. You will uh, leave for three, three days in each uh, report before anybody would be allowed to the plane. Uh, if you want to get out of this, it, it's just the immediate need, immediate need uh, for recovery, because otherwise no, nobody would spend the money. And it's need for establishing some cooperation. Uh, otherwise, we stay on the Easter Island, and we perfectly know what is the end of the Easter Island civilization. Thank you. Leonid Markovich, thank you very much, Professor Grigoriev. It was uh, really a very sobering uh, experience uh, to listen to your arguments. And uh, it will take quite some time to, to uh, you know, uh, get this argument written, I mean, from, from the economist who is in charge, who has the responsibility, and uh, from the experts that kind of trying to uh, trying to explain why, why you are right, why the CDGs are not working. I mean, we had emotional feeling that they will not be working, but we didn't have figures. And now when we have figures, we don't trust them. And uh, uh, really, uh, I appreciate your, uh, 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 I, your uh, idea or, or a thesis that the elites can fight as, as long as they want to. They can fight for 20 years now. No problem with that. Uh, just uh, mass speculations, who was the first to start it, who was the second to uh, react on it and not properly, but it's of no interest. People people are not listening to it. It's, it, it, it has no uh, relation to the way they live, to the way they think, and it has no, no uh, in my uh, 
personal view, it has very uh, light perspective for the elites to survive at all. Maybe, maybe New Zealand is a fantastic place where they can continue their uh, uh, arguments and uh, nice country. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, again, uh, Alexander Dubove, are you in? Yes, I am. Hello. Thank you very much again. And uh, may I kindly ask you to take the floor. And uh, to all the listeners, uh, Professor uh, Aksana Galutvina was not very lucky today. Finally, they have switched off her internet in, 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 in her building. So she uh, thanks everyone for waiting for her. But she will not be uh, speaking after uh, Alexander Dubovoy, and we will invite engineers then to take the floor. It's, cons it's conspiracy. I am absolutely sure it's new from New Zealand. Alexander, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your kind invitation and many thanks for the organizers of this very special great event in these very difficult times. So the topic of my presentation is the European Union in a post-COVID-19 world order. So the starting point of my presentation is the following assumption. The pandemic will not so much change or reshape the pillars of the world order, but rather deepen certain already existing key global trends without, however, fundamentally changing them. Against this background, what key elements of the world order will the European Union have to face in the years to come? So let's focus on four main characteristics. First, new bipolarity. The dissolution of a de facto unipolar world order, the relative decline of the United States, as well as the rise of China, leads to the emergence of a new bipolarity between the United States and China. And this is just an intermediate step towards a confrontative multipolar world system. But nevertheless, this emerging new bipolarity between the United States and China will further increase pressure on the European Union to take sides. Secondly, connectivity wars. According to Mark Leonard from the European Council on Foreign Relations, connectivity wars will be the order of the day. The ties that bind countries together will not be broken. So we don't speak about the end of globalization, but the ties that bind countries together will not create conditions for genuine multilateralism. It will be rather the, uh, the opposite issue. So instead, of that, the major powers will use the links as weapons, leading to further trade wars, cyber attacks, and sanction systems. Thirdly, new regional great powers and the return of the spheres of influence. The relative weakness and decline of the United States goes hand in hand with the rise of powerful regional great powers. These regional great powers have only limited claim to global power but almost unlimited aspirations to regional power in areas of their privileged interests. And these aspirations for regional dominance will lead to the return of the concept of spheres of influence. And fourthly, because of that, we will see a renaissance of the neutrality policy or non-alignment non policy. While in the Cold War, the Western alliance stood against the Soviet bloc, the upcoming new bipolarity will create much more confusion. So most countries will keep their options open and work with the Chinese on some issues and with the Americans on others. But against this background, the non-alignment and or neutrality policy will become an attractive foreign policy option, especially for the countries of the so-called European between. And in this context, Redefining relations with the United States, redefining relations with China will be crucial for the future of the European Union. In 2003, during the European-American debates about the war in Iraq, Germany's foreign minister, Joschka Fischer, 
used the very accurate remark that the United States uh, are a power, but the European Union, on the other hand, is an experience. So today, the European Union is at the point of, uh, of where the European experience cannot be maintained without meaningful political and military action. So the survival, the mere survival of the European Union will depend heavily on the capacity of European governments and citizens to perceive the European Union as a sovereign power that can compete with all the other great powers. So what makes the European Union particularly vulnerable uh, in this new era? And um, so the main problem which, which makes the European Union particularly vulnerable in the new era is that the European Union still see itself as America's ally. And for good reason. So after all, the United States uh, have been de facto European power, true ally and friendly hegemon for the last decades. But American security policy seems no longer to include the concept of allies. And according to Daniel Hamilton, the United States is no longer acting as an European power, but rather becoming an external power in Europe. Because of that, the United States will play a more destabilizing role rather than a stabilizing role for the survival of the European Union. And there's also a severe risk that um, some of the EU member states will prefer to base their security on bilateral agreements with the United States. Today, for the first time in history, the European Union is faced with a situation uh, in which none of the other great powers is really involved or interested in the preservation and success of the European Union. On the contrary, they are attempting to become involved in domestic policy of the various member states of the European Union in the hope to weaken the European Union and make it work for their interests. And against this background, we should ask ourselves the question, can the European Union go wrong? Europe has repeatedly failed over the past 70 years, according to Ivan Krastev, and those failures have been the building blocks of the European Union's success. But things are different today. And yes, of course, the European Union can go wrong. And the European Union can no longer take peace for granted. And what is even more serious, it should not even take the American military and nuclear umbrella for granted. For although NATO still exists, the present American government, and also probably the future ones, we will not see the security threats in the world through the eyes of its allies. And the possible collapse of the EU represents an existential threat for all member states of the European Union. And at the same time, the mere survival of the EU, a kind of muddling through, is not sufficient to guarantee its security. So the security of the European Union and the Europeans will depend on the EU's ability to strengthen its strategic autonomy, build an autonomous defense identity based on enhanced military capabilities. An European army is decades to go. Let's just face the obvious. And PESCO is uh, quite a nice try, but definitely not good enough. Maybe after a possible withdrawal of the United States from the NATO, the NATO could become an interesting vehicle, a starting point for an European army. But the first step should be finding new political identity for the European Union, because none of the political ideological narratives of the past beat the narrative of the post-1945, of the post-1968, or of the post-1989, seem to make any sense today, especially the most recent narrative, the Francis Fukuyama's notion of the end of history. Francis Fukuyama was definitely right at least 
for the EU itself. We are at the end of history when the past does not matter anymore to the present. And the price for the long peace period of the European Union was the relinquishment of historical memory. But as Walter Russell Mead put it pointedly, history is back and history is hungry. So the long period of peace and prosperity of the European Union in the last 30 years was rather quite an anomaly of international relations and the liberal world order in which the European project is deeply rooted no longer exists. And this, there are hardly any turnarounds to expect through the change of American policy, because the American policy will not change anytime soon. And uh, since we have, um, since the Scott friends takes place in Moscow, at the Moscow State University, maybe just the very last point of the uh, EU-Russia relations. So, what did go wrong in our relations? I think the main point is that there were different expectations and mutually exclusive narratives from the beginning. And these different expectations and mutually exclusive narratives led to the fact that a common vision about our future, about the relation between the European Union and Russia could never emerge. Both sides used the same terms and yet understood them to mean different things. Although there were countless forums for dialogue, both sides talked past each other for over 25 years. And because of that, massive mutual disappointment and alienation was thus programmed. So the mutual sanctions are against this background just the visible expression of our alienation. And despite the weakening of the transatlantic ties, only a purely pragmatic economic partnership between the European Union and Russia itself is conceivable in the near future. And I think that in the next years, our relationship will maintain kind of strategic decoupling. It was uh, initiated back in 2014 after the outbreak of the Ukrainian crisis. And in this sense, we will face a dynamic status quo in the relations of the EU and Russia, which will assume a hybrid, cooperative, confrontative character and oscillate between pragmatic cooperation and hybrid confrontation. And uh, just the very last question, if you remember this old uh, Radio Yerevan joke, when will the things get better? Radio Yerevan was once asked, when will the things get better? And the answer was, as many of you know, it has been already better. So, thank you. Uh, dear Alexander, thank you very much for your brilliant presentation. Um, being Russian, I would say uh, things are always a little bit not normal, but I mean, we still hope for uh, a more pragmatic, better page in our relations. Thank you very much. And uh, I really appreciate your logic and I, frankly, I share it. Uh, Dr. Splitek, uh, are you ready? Uh, Okay, perfect. Можно так доложить, да? Добрый день. Я с вашим разрешением буду говорить на русском языке, потому что за 68 лет английский. Значит, я хочу, во-первых, поблагодарить, что могу участвовать в этой конференции, и хотел бы поговорить о чешско-российских отношениях особенно экономических, за последних 10 лет. Я работаю последних 13 лет как председатель управления делового совета предпринимателей Чешской Республики по сотрудничеству с Российской Федерацией. Если в целом надо оценить сегодняшние чешско-российские отношения, включая экономические и торговые, 
Конечно, надо прежде всего посмотреть, какой, какие взаимный баланс между нашей торговлей. Поэтому я буду использовать некоторые цифры за последних 10 лет. Так, например, торговые отношения фактически колебаются на уровне где-то от 3,5 до 4 миллиарда долларов чешских изделий ежегодно в Россию и где-то от 4 до 4,5 миллиардов долларов США в Чехию. Среди нам наиболее известных чешских изделий, которые экспортируем в Российскую Федерацию в последних 10 годах, это прежде всего автомобили Шкода, различные автозапчасти. Например, в прошлом году это было где-то за 670 миллионов долларов США. Разные компьютеры, датчики за 310 миллионов долларов. Потребительские товары для семей игрушки, коляски за 150 миллионов долларов, лекарства, медикаменты, материалы для семьи, авиационные двигатели и так дальше. Конечно, в том числе технологию для современной малой и средней энергетики, которая была также очень удачно в последние годы экспортирована в Российскую Федерацию. Сегодня такой маленький сюрприз – может быть, вы знаете свечи зажигания, Бриск, Табор, Русицкий город. Мало кто знает, что каждая третья, четвертая свеча зажигания в России является чешской маркой Бриск, Табор. Конечно, имеет свой завод, дочерный завод в Толяке, в Российской Федерации, в Самарской области. Но следует отметить, что около 80% чешского экспорта идет в соседнюю федеральную республику Германия. И сколько чешских товаров реэкспортируется в Россию под немецким брендами, никто не знает. Предполагаю, что даже больше, чем составляет прямой чешский экспорт. Автомобильной промышленности, а также в точном и транспортном машиностроении это однозначно. Что касается российского экспорта в Чешскую республику, то он по-прежнему долговременно выше по сравнению с чешским экспортом в Россию. И варьируется от 4 до 5 миллиардов долларов США в год. Конечно, разница в среднем составляет от 500 до 800 миллионов долларов в пользу Российской Федерации. Как в прошлом, например, чешские компании покупают в России в основном сырье, такое как нефть, природный газ, химические сырье и прочее. Только в прошлом году импорт нефтепродуктов в Чешскую Республику составлял 1 миллиард 700 миллионов долларов США, природного газа почти 9 миллиардов кубов за на сумму 1,6 миллиардов долларов, изделия из железа, алюминия около 300 миллионов долларов, сырья для чешской химической промышленности угля около 350 миллионов долларов и так дальше. Такие также были очень интересные цифры в туризме. Например, с 2010 года до конца прошлого года посетило Чехию более 5 миллионов россиян. И Чешская республика, особенно Прага, Чешский Крумов и также, конечно, курорты Карлови, Вари, Марианские Лазни и другие в нашей стране стали очень популярными зарубежными направлениями для россиян. Например, в прошлом году из 10 миллионов иностранных туристов, которые проживали более 2-3 дня в Чехии, было более 600 тысяч россиянов. Но мало кто знает, что российские туристы, что касается ночей, которые ночуют в чешских гостиницах, на первом месте по пребывающих 5 цен ночей. Поэтому в целом можно констатировать, что Несмотря на разные политические, не всегда хорошие отношения, обмен товарами, обмен в туризме продолжается. Следует открыто сказать, что взаимные общественные и, конечно, экономические отношения могли бы быть значительно лучше, чем сегодня. С 2013 года на двусторонние отношения очень негативно повлияли разные эмбарго 
i zapreti na eksport rada savremenih českih mačinostrojitelnih tehnologij v Rasijsko federaciji. Buď to zapreti embargo sa storoni Evrosajuza, šedom katorovo konečno Čehija javljajca, no k seželenju osobeno amerikansko embargo, katero je bezkompromisno zatragiva je ljubiv česku kampanju, katero je narušajt embargo še na Rasijsko federaciju. A je to opet že osobeno mašinostrojitelnega produkcija, katero je izvjestna Česka va vso mira. Je to konečno pečalni fakt in menja ne pa gledaj vesma gor, ko je ašuščenje tavo, što nekatere české politiki v nastojšče vremja zaupotrebljajo. Je to i situacije, kak na municipalnom, tak i na nacionalnom urovni. In takže rjad, na moj vzgled, provokacijonih dejstvih, katere ne pomagajo vlučiti socialnije, i občestveni i osobeno ekonomičeski odnošenja Česko-Rasijske. No ja ubežden, što takih politikov nje mnogo, k saželenju, a ni zanimal značiteljno mjesto v Českih SMI. I vedom odnošenja SMI okazijo vesma negativno evlijanje, v tom čiste na ekonomičeski odnošenja među Čehije in Rasije. Delavoj savjet predprenimatelji Českoj Respublike i naš partner, Delavoj savjet Rasijsko federacije, pa sodnoče so Čekije. Mi zanimajem se osobeno rjadom udačnih metodov, kar organizujem konferenci, seminari, učastujem z našimi kampanjami na krupnih vistavkah, jarmarkah, ja bi mogo skazati na primjer izvjestnoju Brnjensku mašinostrojitelju jarmarku Česko Respublike in na obarot mi učastujem pačti každi god na mašinostrojitelno vistavke in na prom v Jekaterinburge. Poslednje godi mi takže sa sredotačima in sa nadstadejstvije v ostanovljenje satrudničstva među českim in rasijskim vračami, katore je, k sažalenju, poste 89. goda polnostju razpavost in faktičeski prekratilo svoje sučestovanje v socijalnom urovnje. Mi v prošlom gadu, v dekabrije, starovo po četvrtovo, organizovali v Moskve baršuje konferenciju Zdarovje dla vseh, je to bila trok staroneja konferencija Česka Respublika, Rasijska Federacija, Veliko Britanija, gde prinjali učastje i ustanovali pravne kontakte sa svojimi rasijskimi kolegami vedušče Českije kardiologi, onkologi in epidemiologi. Konečno tako da mi što daže ne dumali, što može biti takaja mežnarodna pandemija koronavirusa, katera je v tečenji dvog mjesece v polnostju prevratila globalne paličinske, socijalne in ekonomičske odnošenja. In pa sredstvi, katerih mi vže načinajem až uščati i v Českoj Respublike, vidje načala Varšovo ekonomičnjskega krizisa, reskovo zamedljenja Českoj ekonomiki in konečno že Českoj eksporta. In takže polno je zamaroživanje mežnarodnega turizma, katerih za poslednje 20 let stal faktički novim ekonomičnim sektorom v ekonomike Českoj Respublike. V rezultati etovo mežnarodnovo ekonomičnjskega krizisa valovi vnutreni produkt Čehiji takže resko upadjo. Poslednje opublikovane oficijalne dani Českoj nacionalno banka govorjati o tom, što v Českoj ekonomike a že dajem spad VVP do 13 i boleje procento v sravnjeni z rekordnim godom 2019. Konečno je to bude svjazano iz neprijatnim rostom bezrabotnici rostom socijalnih problem, što nje samjeno zatroni ne toliko Česku Respubliku, no vse strane i Evrosajuza, Rasijsku federaciju, može biti pačiti vse strane in vira. Pa je tomu mi hatim našimi pravjerenimi formami in nadjožnimi metodami pradažati in v bližajšem vremje toliko pandemija nam pozvoliti in budu snjati vse ti raznije embarga in načnu letati samoljoti, organizovati česko-rasijske meroprijatja na osobeno delavom urovni. In na obarot mi dumajem, što je to krizis, on pračisti rinu v drugoj storovni. Mnogo takih posredničeskih kampanji, katere boli so zdane agromno je kaličestvo obagrotit, in pa zvoliti kampanijam nadjožnim, katere je vidu z etovo krizisa silnimi, rabotati napravno. Pa je tomu mi gotovi, nesmatra na eti težove momenti, 
продолжать нашу работу. Я сам оптимист, потому что на протяжении всей своей жизни с прогресса с ядом фундаментальных политических и экономических событий и перемен. Поэтому я и сейчас верю, что даже этот печальный политический период и недобрые на данный момент честно-российские отношения скоро закончатся, а мы вернемся к корректным всесторонним отношениям, уважая друг друга, причем уважая и определенные отличия наших стран. В заключении моего доклада я бы хотел поблагодарить организаторов конференции, а именно господин Валтера Швивервас и господина Владимира Куликова за предоставленную мне возможность принять участие в конференции и высказать свою актуальную оценку Ческо-Российских отношений, особенно экономических. И, конечно, как мы видим, хоть это сегодня очень сложно, перспективе взаимного сотрудничества. Спасибо за внимание. Уважаемый господин Избыток, блестящее ваше выступление, которое подталкивает к мысли о том, что и европейские большие структуры, и отдельные государства и России все-таки, скорее всего, перейдут к многоаспектной политике, к многоаспектному взаимодействию. Мне не нравится слово гибридный, но в этом, пожалуй, есть большой Большой, большое будущее, и я надеюсь, что мы сможем подготовить какие-то бумаги, которые могли бы вашу точку зрения довести до структур, принимающих решения. Я бы попросил Александра Рара приготовить, выступить сейчас, поскольку, поскольку у Оксаны Викторовны интернета нет, и было бы замечательно, если бы вы поддержали своим выступлением наше мероприятие, Александр. Vladimir, thank you very much for uh, the invitation. Um, I listened carefully to the speeches of my Austrian colleagues, Mr. Schwimmer and Mr. Kubovi. I think they presented uh, a very thoughtful view on uh, how the European architecture, how our relations with the United States, China, and with Russia are developing, how they might develop uh, in the aftermath of the Corona crisis. My talk here will be focusing, will be special, uh, will be focusing on uh, the question of Ostpolitik, uh, of the German Eastern policy, whether this is still possible or not. You all remember uh, the term of uh, Eastern policy came from uh, the German West, um, West German uh, policy of Willy Brandt and Egon Barr uh, 50 years ago, which was directed uh, towards uh, some kind of approchement with the Soviet Union at that time. To make it shortly, I think that the revival of this policy is today uh, rather impossible. Why? Because of other geopolitical circumstances uh, that in the 21st century than we had in the 20s. Um, but a strategic cooperation between the European Union and Russia in specific areas is very much possible. And it could be also successful. Uh, at the end, uh, I think that uh, we should uh, also try to revive the historical idea of a wider, or better say, a bigger Europe. This idea is definitely not dead. Uh, let's uh, look very shortly in, uh, in the past. Uh, we had, uh, over the last 200 years, we had uh, a lot of changes in the European uh, security architecture. We had the Holy Roman Empire, which break up because it was destroyed by Napoleon. Then we had uh, the destruction of Napoleon by a coalition of European states. We had the Vienna Congress, which itself lasted 400 years and was destroyed by the First World War. Um, after the end of the First World War, we had the Versailles uh, Order, which was again destroyed by, uh, by, by, by Hitler attacks on his neighbors. Uh, we had then the, def the, the defeat of, of, of Hitler by the, um, by the Allies and uh, the establishing of the Yalta order, which lasted for almost 75 years. And this was order was destroyed and changed by the fall of Berlin Wall. Um, after the fall of Berlin Wall, we had a new, establishing a new order, which I would call the new Paris Charter Order. Exactly 30 years ago, all states of Europe, including the United States and Canada, signed 
this charter, which became a fundament for this new European, but I would say also liberal world order. That again, order had been, in my view, destroyed by the Ukrainian crisis, but not only by the Ukrainian crisis uh, five years ago, but also by the um, NATO and the new enlargement uh, against uh, Russia, against Russian interests in the past decade. Now a new European order is emerging, uh, but it will be again built on the destruction of the old order. How it will look like um, is um, an interesting, um, it's, it's worthwhile interestingly discussing it, but uh, I'm not sure yet in which direction it will go. The old Ostpolitik, it was clear, was uh, focused on detente, on arms reductions, on arms treaties, on multilateral institutions which have been successfully established in uh, Europe and in the world uh, during the Cold War. We had an energy alliance which was functioning other than today. We had uh, also a Helsinki process, the OSCE, which brought East and West closer and closer together. At the end, the Berlin Wall break apart. Democracy came in whole Europe. We had a reunification of Germany. We had the end of Cold War and we had an end of communism. And uh, for the years 1990 till 2014, we built on these principles and the successes of this old Ostpolitik. The Ostpolitik was a key, key uh, for understanding the future and for building a common future. There was a clear chance of establishing a common European security and economic space through all uh, on the whole territory of the OSCE states. Then in the second decade of the 21st century, this old Ostpolitik was dest destroyed. We speak definitely of a destruction of this policy. Why? Again, because NATO and EU were began, became the only pillars of Europe uh, and Russia uh, had no place in the security architecture of uh, this new Europe. Uh, the European Union started to conduct an Ostpolitik against Russia, focusing on the interests and the context, context of the East European uh, states, uh, which were uh, closer to Germany and France and the old Europeans than Russia which uh, was more distant to, to the new European Union. And uh, also the post-Soviet republics became, through the new neighboring policy, uh, a target of this Ostpolitik, which again, it was interpreted by Russia and others as uh, something which was directed against Moscow. Uh, the prop in my view, one of these uh, crucial things, crucial misunderstandings and misconception was that the European Union faced and wanted to, uh, to build its partnerships with countries like Russia solely on values and not interest, like in the 20th century, where interests play a very important role in the Ostpolitik. Uh, the West was against any kind of nationalism on uh, European soil, and the fact that Russia started to build uh, a national state caused uh, alarm in the capitals of, uh, of the West. And uh, if you ask today a very simple question, what does the EU want from Russia? The question, the answer will be very easy. EU wants and waits until Russia becomes dem democracy. Then it's uh, pre prepared to work with Russia again. I think it's not a strategy. I think it's not a concept, but it's a fact. Now we ask Russia. Russia also made a lot of proposals over the past 20 years, over the past 30 years, but uh, Russia never became concrete. It made, uh, Medvedev had speeches here, Putin made speeches here, were wonderful speeches, but there was no, um, no, no more content coming from think tanks, from uh, the elites in Russia, what they want from Europe. If you ask today what Russia wants from Europe, you won't get a clear answer, at least I don't hear it. I hope we'll get it maybe in a conference like this. Yes, uh, Russia would say we want trade, we want recognition of Russia in Europe, we want a reduction of the role of the United States, uh, but this is uh, not enough to move towards uh, building a common uh, European future. Uh, and so we have a resurrection of Europe in the boundaries of the Holy Empire, uh, Holy Rom Roman Empire of a <laughs> thousand years ago, without Russia and with a very strong and existing value gap in, in Europe, which from my point of view is dangerous. I agree with Alexander Dubovo. It's even becoming stronger, this gap. The Western and Central East European states integrated uh, into a US global security project. The Russia, of course, is not part of this global US security project and will never be. 
But the West is becoming a civilizational project, which uh, of course uh, is aligned and even hostile in many ways to the Russian uh, traditional civilization project and of course to China, which is now uh, starting also to play a more vivid role in the East of, uh, of Europe. I'm coming uh, to the end. I would say that um, in the past 10 years, yes, we had uh, seen some attempts to revise and revive the Ostpolitik. We wanted to find new fields of cooperation, like for example, in combating terrorism, in climate change, in uh, migration policies, in stabilizing the greater Middle East. That did not materialize. We are still living um, in a world where uh, completely uh, two different narratives uh, uh, split uh, our thinking and split our policy in this uh, very crucial on this very crucial issues where we could cooperate. But I think in two fields we could achieve cooperation and a new Ostpolitik. First, this is a common security space under the definition of a new security aspects. And this uh, is, for example, the fight of pandemia. It's a fight against uh, uncontrolled migration. And it is the stability of the Middle East. We have to, to, to find common ways to create this common um, uh, security space. I think that could happen in Europe. And the second is something what uh, Vladimir Kulikov and myself are working with uh, other colleagues in Germany on, on, on that. This is the issue of a Green Deal, a new green alliance between Russia and the European Union. A lot of articles are being published about this now. We're trying to, to revive this, this debate or start this debate. I think it's a new chance to create a common a green space between Lisbon to Vladivostok, but it should become a win-win situation for both sides, for the West and for the Russians. Russia is the biggest land in, 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 in Europe and uh, Siberia and uh, everything that belongs to, to, to Russia is also part of lung uh, to, to, uh, which makes Europe live. And uh, it's much closer to, our, to us than the Amazons in Brazil. So we need to find ways to cooperate. Ecological uh, agriculture is a field where we can cooperate. Hydrogen technology instead of fossil uh, fuels is a possibility in 20, 30 years, where, but we will start to develop the technology, mutual technology right now. And they are, we are working on this. Plus, of course, common technology in developing alternative energy uh, resources. I think this is a very interesting theme. It's, uh, I would say, it's political correct. It uh, brings us not against each other. It can only bring us together. It points the way how to build a, a, a safer and a better and a more comfortable world. Let's uh, work on that and thank you for the invitation. Alexander, thank you very much for your brilliant speech and uh... It gives us a big picture and uh, is a number of small pictures. So uh, even multi uh, expected policy should be based on, 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 some, on some ground, which you, which you have uh, proposed. And uh, uh, I share them with you. You know it. And I will be doing my job as, far, as, as long as I can do it. Uh, I would add that. Uh, without kind of calibrating the pictures of what we want in 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 let's say 10 or 15 years from now in the field of education which is absolutely crucial there are hundreds of thousands of, of younger uh, russian children who are studying german not because they don't like english english is okay with them but as a uh, second most important uh, question because they are looking for some answers on how did Germany and German cultural heritage influence the idea of economy, what you call Wirtschaft. Many of us here doesn't even know that there's a difference between economics and Wirtschaft. So uh, I find this additional space of cooperation which we can influence. I mean, we, we, of course, we will prepare the necessary documents for the uh, leadership of Moscow State University, but this is a small thing that might turn big. It's not German influence in Russia or Russian influence in Germany. 
it's the interest of the uh, next generation towards more um, comprehensive, open, and uh, very global linked world for them, for, for, for this younger generation. So uh, I think there's one more uh, sphere where we can communicate and try to exchange uh, the best online courses. Because, because hopefully there are also many children in, in uh, Germany who would like to understand where, where the Russia will develop when they will be, become grown-ups. Thank you very much again. Sorry for talking too much. Thank you. Well, and now I would like to give the, uh, the floor to our young colleague, to the student of the Faculty of Global Problems of Moscow. University, Maria Vysochkina. Maria, please share with us your ideas of uh, yeah. zones Russia and China. Uh, please, Maria, I'll uh, well switch on your presentation and you please tell me when I have to uh, show your slides 11 and well, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Uh, yes, yes, it's correct. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I do. Yes, perfect. So you can start right now. I uh, will. Just, yeah, just set it and uh, for the whole presentation, it will be showing the 11th slide. Great. Mm, 11th slide, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Check at the moment. Okay. So while you're setting, I guess I can start. So uh, greetings, everyone. I'm happy to participate in such great scientific event as Congress of Globalistics uh, 2020. And I would like to tell you today about free economic zones of uh, China and free economic zones of uh, Russia and comparing them. Uh, first of all, the definition of free economic zone uh, unfortunately, overall, there is no clear definition of uh, free economic zone. I um, took out the average one. It is a special economic zone or free economic zone is a designated territory of a state that has special preferential regime for business activities in customs, uh, participants, investment and technology. Uh, in Russia, there is also a special definition for free economic zone. It is shown in uh, the state law and it is pretty um, dry and uns unspecified, so I'm not going to read it. Uh, but I'm going to be focusing on the Chinese uh, special economic zones or free economic zones, as you wish, uh, the zones, because uh, as we know, the rising economy of China was due to a uh, huge success of these zones, especially Shenzhen free economic zone. So uh, I'm gonna tell you right now about the main goals of the first uh, Chinese economic zones. Uh, they, are, they were made to attract foreign capital so that on its basis, uh, the government can start development of the coastal cities as well, create them as a window to the world, attracting foreign direct investments, as I said, and innovative technologies, creating and developing the infrastructure on the territory of, it, of the zones itself, and using the foreign investors as channels for selling goods, uh, which ensures uh, an increase of exports and income for the whole country itself and also transforming the country's policy of openness and external economy and uh, leading China to the country with uh, special um, socialism with uh, market specialties. 
So the main preferen uh, the preferential measures for residents of these Chinese zones are mainly tax incentives, custom privileges, and more loyal currency and finance regulation. Uh, so they simplify for the residents' uh, taxes, regulations, and also uh, reduce uh, payments for resources and services such as utilities, land lease, buildings, and structures. Uh, so the main success of Shenzhen Special Economic Zone is uh, that uh, districts, cities, and provinces of China have established their own trade structures on the territory of the zone. Through the work, through the work of these structures, they export their products to the world. Uh, this process helps to reduce the economic gap between coastal cities and inner regions of the country. Also, the zone has created all possible conditions for attracting the latest technologies as well as reproducing them. So uh, now Shenzhen is well known for its uh, technological advancements and uh, this is all due to these uh, attractions. And using all available means of production, the zone develops production on the basis of joint cooperation between Chinese and for, uh, foreign founders, foreign investors. Uh, this also brings out uh, the problem on the early stage of Shenzhen when uh, these joint companies um, were secluded by Chinese partner and the foreign partner. And uh, mostly only the Chinese partner invested its money, not the foreign one. So in the zone, uh, the Chinese capital was circulating as a foreign one. And that was a huge problem. Uh, so the next thing I'm going to tell you that these, uh, these zones in China cre gradually created a new foreign trade system, uh, the leading direction of which is production to the world market according to the international standards. So in the zone, there is a unified management, joint conduct of foreign trade, coordination of activities, gradually developing corporatization and the system of regulating activities by the government through economic and legal measures and is supplemented by administrative methods from the central government itself. Uh, the problems of the zone today are, well, you can see them on slide partially, and also it's traffic, it's environmental pollution, it's difficulties for providing uh, services for everyone in a densely populated area. And previously on the early stages, as I said, the circulation of Chinese capital, and also there was problem of illiquid uh, currency, Asian uh, and also there were pro several problems with providing water resources and electricity to support all the industrial zone. As for Russian special economic zones, I can say uh, they originally started uh, since two, 2005 with adoption of federal law about special economic zones in the Russian Federation. And in 2006, an official decree created a company, special economic zones, 100% of whose shares are owned by the government. Uh, the purpose is to develop manufacturing industries, high-tech industries, tourism, health resorts, port and transport infrastructure. It is officially and it can be seen in the uh, law itself. Today, uh, there are 25 zones currently operating Russian Federation, but the result of the most of them is criticized due to the low efficiency of budget funds, low interest of local officials in the effective cooperation of the SES, uh, excessive bureaucratization of SES. Uh, so to solve some bureaucratic issues, you should go to the Moscow instead of solving them at the place of the zone itself. It's uh, very inconvenient. But uh, creating free economic zones in Russia overall is a great experience and a great possibility for the, not only developing the country's economy overall, but also for uh, underdeveloped uh, Siberian regions and the Far East. Uh, so the preferences are created exclusively for uh, says residents and uh, unfortunately 
grants are granted to non-governmental companies that are not related to the zones. Also, it is worth noting that the tourist zones do not have custom privileges and do not use customs procedures. Uh, there are production also and port issues that do not receive proper attention. For example, there was an idea of creating a Tumangan zone, or as it's as it uh, alternately called uh, zone uh, was a plan to uh, access the cooperation with China, Korea, Japan, but uh, unfortunately the project was frozen. Uh, Chinese in, uh, invested a lot of money and capital, especially in the railway, but Russia did not show sufficient activity for the development of, of this project, so it was cancelled and frozen at all. Uh, right now, according to the Ministry of Industrial Zones, there are Overall, as I, as I said, those were criticized due to the lack of its efficiency. The creation of one workplace in the zone in the end cost uh, 10.2 million rubles. And as a result, only 21.1 thousand jobs were created overall for these years. However, uh, there are some positive examples of Russian special economic zones. Among them, Alabuga zone, Taliati zone, Lipetsk zone, and St. Petersburg zone. Uh, in 2017, the FDI magazine, the annual global rating for economic zones, uh, especially noted the St. Petersburg zone for active cooperation with business incubators for startups wishing to switch to large scale production. So, as I think, uh, can you please show the next slide? Uh, yes. Oh, God. Okay, so uh, a possible measures that improve Russian zones to become successful are the following. Uh, the zone operation should be based on a long-term development plan for a specific zone itself. Without this plan, no budget funding should be provided. Uh, second, to improve the legislation of the regulation uh, the zones clarifying existing legislation or possibly introducing new, new uh, uh, laws. Uh, also, it probably uh, would be better to expand the benefits, tax, customs, administrative preferences, uh, the list of permitted activities, including uh, not, special, not only specialized, but also related activities to be carried out on the territory. Also, the, uh, they can be encouraging the provision of additional services to the residents, such as centralized PR, consulting, legal, financial services, educational services, equipment rental, etc., cetera, uh, ensuring a significant financial responsibility of the subjects, federation subjects, and managing companies for non-fulfillment of uh, obligations introducing financial incentives for local leaders based on the results of economic progress in a particular region, and ensuring control over proper spending of budget funds, transparency of their use, and stimulating not only the territories, but also uh, priority industries with special benefits. Uh, so as example, uh, establish additional benefits for participants in fishing activities in Primorsky, region in conditions for free port of Vladivostok. So uh, overall, I can say that Russian special zones have a great potential for development. Uh, one of the main problems is uh, lack of laws, law le legislation, and also the intransparency of uh, spending the budget funds. But with all possible measures, we can create as successful zones as they were created in China in 1970s, 1980s. Um, thank you, that's it. Thank you very much, Maria. It's a really very interesting uh, 
presentation and very interesting speech. However, I have a question. Uh, what is your personal opinion? What do you think? If uh, these uh, economic zones really have a future? In Russia or in the world? Both, in, in Russia and in China. Well, I guess in China, they are already have uh, changed their initial purpose from being the windows to the world. They are now a basement of innovation and creation of new technologies. So right now, the Shenzhen Zone has changed its slogan from, um, how to translate it properly, from made in Shenzhen to created in Shenzhen. Um, so like, actually, the uh, sorry. So actually, they are yeah. not uh, economic zone anymore. It's something different. Well, they call they still are called economic zones, but their um, purpose and their their actions are actually a lot more different than it was in uh, the 1990s, 1980s. So right now it's sure. like more in innovative zones and mm -hmm. creating new technologies and also, um, I don't know, it's a base for a com telecommunication uh, agency okay, in the Shenzhen especially. Yeah. And, also, and as for Russian uh, part, I guess uh, we have a possibility if we manage the zones and control them properly. Okay. Thank you, Maria, very much. And now I think we deserve a break. I believe that uh, we can stop our conference for 10 minutes. Now it's uh, uh, 2.30 on my watch. So we can start our last session at uh, 2.40 uh, Moscow times. Okay, and uh, you do not mind. Professor Vermini, be ready to start the uh, event, okay? Good. Professor Vermini, what do you think about it? Okay, great. So in 10 minutes, we'll start. So thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take a ten minute. Let's take a ten minute break. Vladimir. Да. Ну что, по-моему, идет очень хорошо, как ты считаешь? Я бы сказал больше, поскольку поскольку у кого интернет закончился, неспроста. Да, 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 да. Я думаю, что интернет он как-то так сам собой не заканчивается. Блестяще выступил Вальтер, он как-то центровал. Очень, молодец, молодец, Центровал. очень хорошо. Нет, а все, все прекрасно выступали. Наши делать... Блестяще. Да, Блестяще. да замечательно. Все замечательно выступили. И несмотря на то, что, конечно, мы даем больше времени, чем обещали, тем не менее, мне кажется, очень хорошо. Спасибо. Хорошо, что не бывает. Ладно, сейчас последний добьем, и все будет хорошо. Давай, пошли пить кофе. Да, можно будет пойти. Александр Тенгизович, можно спросить? Thank you. 
Uh, well, we are waiting for Vladimir. Should we wait another two minutes or we can check. start? Uh, for some reason, I'm not in. Okay, you are here. So, can yeah. we start? Yes, sure, please. I don't have, the, yeah, the big picture, but I will try. Yeah, I have it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Dr. Vilmini, would you like to continue? Uh, please uh, turn on your microphone. We cannot hear you. Yes, of course. Do, uh, uh, should I start do, the presentation? Do, yes, yes, please. We we'll can be on the first slide. Dobry, dobry dzień. It's a pleasure to be to be here with you today, in such an esteemed uh, company of colleagues. My thematic is a little bit more narrow uh, compared with the previous one. Is about uh, the effect of uh, globalization compared with regionalism in Central Asia, and uh, more specifically, how the uh, possibility of uh, accession of the Uzbekistan to the European uh, Euro Eurasian Economic Union can change dynamics in the region. First slide, please. Just a moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's it. Yeah, to approach this thematic, uh, first of all, we have to look at uh, what globalization meant uh, for Central Asia during the first year of independence, and uh, the source of, uh, to look which were the source of the globalization in the region. Uh, essentially, globalization was uh, a process led by the 
moment of unipolarity of uh, the United States, the hegemony that the United States and the Western countries had on international relation. It was uh, so, Central Asia was caught in the uh, neoliberal economic uh, approaches uh, of the so called Washington Consensus, uh, so liberalization, privatization, and uh, in economic terms, this led to um, Central Asia becoming. Uh, a um, supplier of uh, natural resources for global economy. Parallel cultural processes uh, were the democratization paradigm, uh, pressure for changing uh, their um, political system inside the region. In cultural terms, uh, there was uh, also pressure for uniformization, for adopting foreign models inside the region. Security terms, the situation remained quite vague as there was no, there were no mechanisms that were provided to uh, face the challenge in, in, uh, of security within the region. Other uh, sources of globalization then became uh, the action of China that uh, was quite absent in the first of independence and then uh, became more prominent in the after 2000 and more uh, determinant after in the, in the last day so with the adoption of the Belt and Road strategy and the infrastructure project that China is uh, enforcing into the region, the growth consequences and changing the, uh, the technological industrial uh, profile of the, of the whole region. Still important as a source of globalization, the Islamic one that was changing the cultural values and the cultural environment of the country and the region, some other minor. But the effects uh, were quite uh, negative. The industrialization of the region, again, uh, the country of the region became suppliers of raw materials. Cultural disorientation, difficult to find themselves in the, in the new environment. And as a final result, as uh, pointed out by Vinokurov and Liebman, this, uh, the, the region became a vast uh, and economically insignificant uh, uh, space uh, lying between uh, the two main economic centers of power that were the EU and East Asia. Next, please. Uh, we were not going by slides, yeah? That's it. Oh, yeah. Yes, and there's still next one, please. This one? So the, yeah, so to, to navigate this new environment where attempted regionalism were uh, somewhere externally uh, projected to, to the region, the United States and the leading uh, globalization agent uh, enforced a different strategy for the region. First, the Silk Road and Greater Central Asia, uh, lately C5 plus one. Uh, most of them were remained declaratory and uh, were ne never supported by an adequate uh, uh, amount of resources for such a great uh, project. There were some Turkish inspired uh, uh, projects, uh, also without uh, adequate follow up. Uh, other organizations like the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, uh, still with Turkey and with Iran, but uh, all, all of them without uh, real consequences. So the five states by themselves tried to constitute a separate region. There were different attempts uh, at that during the 90s. Uh, they went, uh, they were not successful uh, because of internal contradiction between the five states. Uh, the fact that uh, state like Turkmenistan followed the line of absolute sovereignty that were, was not compatible with uh, resources and uh, political projects. And uh, the situation changed only, only when Russia tried to decide to be, uh, become himself, uh, itself an external driver of regionalization. Next, please. Yeah, so, uh, no, we the previous one, please. The previous? Yes. Whatever you say. Yeah, no, there should be one. In, I have one about Uzbekistan in mind. It's not there. Let's see. This? Which yes, one? this one. Yeah. This one? Uh, no, Uzbekistan, Uzbekistan. This? Uzbekistan. 
Okay. Yeah. So uh, to 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 understand uh, the, the the development of regionalism in uh, in Central Asia, it's important to, to pay attention which was the trajectory of uh, political trajectory of Uzbekistan since independence. Uzbekistan followed uh, in economic internal terms uh, a model of uh, developmental state that was baked by the strong national ideology based on self-reliance, that uh, central point of which was that never join an external bloc and follow an independent uh, way of uh, development. Uzbekistan and Central Asia, Uzbekistan tried to be the uh, engine of integration, but this integration was uh, intended to be as uh, uh, modeled around itself, what was perceived by the other country as an hegemonic uh, attempt to control the region. Uzbekistan at a certain point uh, tried to become uh, the regional reference for the United States policy toward the region in Central Asia. This was not uh, successful or as, as expected by Tashkent. So uh, Uzbekistan tried to uh, follow the pendulum, so called pendulum swinging orientation in foreign policy, moving between uh, uh, mainly between Russia and uh, the United States. The same for the integration project, uh, uh, Eurasian integration project uh, supported by Russia. But in the end, uh, until uh, 2016, mainly acted as an obstacle, as the main obstacle to regional uh, integration and, and connectivity. Next, please. You're about Russia. Hmm, bit strange. Next, please. Just a moment. Okay, this is this one. Yes. So finally, regional integration went uh, uh, was enforced by the Russian action. It was uh, a, initially Moscow did, didn't pay attention to regional process. Then uh, he had to cope with them in a bottom down uh, process. It means that uh, phenomena like migra migration and the security threats uh, originated from Central Asia pushed Russia to, uh, to act in this direction to acknowledge the existence of a regional security complex where the security of uh, the Russian Federation was uh, um, strictly linked to the one of the, the local states. Um, first initiative went out in the 2000 with, uh, with Putin, and then uh, after the 2008 glo global economic crisis, uh, uh, more uh, the Russian action, action became more conse consequent. And uh, um, as mentioned before, it uh, went to structure a sphere of influence in, in the region, sphere of influence that is not an imposition to the, to the local state, but is, a is rather a negotiated process where uh, some degree of indirect control is uh, acknowledged by the local state, the influenced state that uh, assume these uh, for their own benefits uh, in, uh, in a quite mutual uh, concerted process. Next one. And then we, 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 this uh, leads to the formation of the Eurasian Economic Union that uh, was, uh, apart from Russian uh, objective of uh, projecting global power, was to share uh, economic benefits for common developments of all of the countries, delineating uh, a moment of new regionalism, regionalism a process that uh, is not only limited to the economic uh, um, sphere, but also goes into cultural, political, and security um, dimension. The main objective is to develop uh, an autonomous path of uh, development between uh, to, 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 to protect the, the, the country of the Union from the impact of the Western lead uh, liberal uh, globalization and as well by the Ch Chinese economic expansion that's becoming more and more uh, prominent into the region. All of this, unfortunately, was interrupted by the uh, Ukrainian conflict in 2014. Next one. I'm running out of time. Sorry. 
Yeah, then uh, at the same time in 2016, uh, Uzbekistan radically changed uh, his perspective and his participation in all these processes. Uh, this was led by internal uh, necessity. Uzbekistan has to develop uh, or to succumb to a number of internal contradictions that it has in demographic and economic terms. Uzbekistan, the new Uzbekistan of uh, post Karimov did and went out with new integration uh, uh, initiatives for the region. Instead, uh, last year, uh, expressed his interest in joining the Eurasian economic uh, uh, integration process. Uh, this is on the base of uh, purely economic calculation to create a new uh, outlet for his uh, national economy, for further uh, to develop his, uh, the export sector of the economy, to uh, overcome his, the challenges of his uh, landlocked condition in, uh, in Eurasia, Benefit from uh, get benefits from the Eurasian Union uh, trade agreements with uh, other economic areas in the world to streamline ener energy uh, supply process, uh, find new uh, sources of investment, and also uh, ideally to improve uh, its governance uh, corresponding to the uh, rules that are uh, elaborated within the. Uh, the Eurasian Economic Union is a rule-based organization. In short, for Uzbekistan, EU, EU, EAIU should become a basis, uh, a platform for uh, technological and legal connectivity with the uh, global area with spe specific filter for that. Next one, please. Yeah, of course, Uzbekistan, the possible uh, membership of Uzbekistan will radically change uh, the outlook of the EU. Uzbekistan is becoming the second largest uh, nation of Eurasian demographic terms. It is a quite uh, developed economy with uh, an interesting industrial sector, but, uh, so that also will uh, change a number of dynamics inside, inside the Union. In the special, can create uh, a strong uh, Central Asia component uh, within the within the Union. In uh, in case, uh, notably, if we'll be able to uh, coordinate with Kazakhstan to create uh, such uh, balancing core, balancing the uh, current asymmetry around the, the Russian economy, and they all can create. Uh, uh, Prospect for uh, sustainable growth uh, with, within the Union. Next, please. So that the Union can better interact with the, with the global economy, uh, protect them from the turbulences of uh, global trade and finance, uh, um, in the perspective, of course, of greater Eurasia, where the as Initially, it was conceived that the Eurasian Economic Union acts as a bridge between the Asia Pacific region and, and Europe and the Middle, the Middle East. Most important, uh, very important in this context, uh, the way that uh, uh, the Union reinforced by Uzbekistan, by Uzbekistan and will be able to uh, interact with the Chinese, influence uh, the big infrastructure projects. Uh, to create uh, a way to harmonize uh, the, the current east-west uh, direction of the Chinese uh, finance infrastructure with the north-south uh, connectivity that uh, is most favored by Russia in order to create uh, an overall uh, harmonic development of the region. It's a, the, this, this new ideal union should have a very strong uh, security dimension. There are still big threats that are coming out from the region in uh, ge geopolitical, demographic, ecological uh, dimensions. Still, Tajikistan, Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan need, need safety belt around them because otherwise uh, they will uh, not be able to face the challenges of the future. They still open the problem of Afghanistan. On the top of all of this, there are important such uh, cultural challenges. Uh, the Eurasian Economic Union should preserve a common cultural space that uh, um, 
to face uh, the challenges of Islamization and other kind of negative uh, uh, globalized influences. For this, uh, as mentioned today, very important the cooperation in science and education that uh, the Eurasian Economic Union will be able to uh, develop together with Uzbekistan in order to preserve uh, uh, the Russian speaking culture that uh, today for Uzbekistan is very important in uh, maintaining uh, a stable society. Next one, please. There are, of course, big challenges to the realization of this ideal scenario. First of all, it refer, they refers to the uh, effectiveness of the institution and rules of the Eurasian Union that very often are uh, not respected by their own members. The fact that the, the common institution are not performing their function as they are supposed to be on, on the paper. It's a matter of the leadership that Russian will be able to exert uh, for the further development on the union. This is, of course, very uh, jeopardized by the still ongoing geopolitical confrontation with the West. In this perspective, uh, Russian appears to be satisfied in considering the uh, Eurasian Economic Union and the membership uh, in it. Uh, in symbolic more than practical terms, so further uh, depriving the institution of their uh, concrete means. For Uzbekistan is a big challenge as well, because the ideology of self-reliance uh, is a very important uh, central uh, element of national ideology, has developed in the last 30 years, so there will be, for sure, big resistances uh, in the, at the level of, of the elites to uh, a full membership to the Union, and remains all the contradiction that uh, prevented uh, regional, uh, regional integration to move forward in the previous year, but uh, more speci uh, especially what the kind of relationship that Shkhan Tanur Sultan can have in the, in, in the coming years. That's, uh, in short, that's everything. I already went out for my 10 minutes. I'm done. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Valmini. My pleasure. Uh, say two words to the speaker. Sure. Uh, just very shortly. Uh, I happen to write, uh, to publish a paper in Russian on EAS uh, two years ago, uh, end of 18. So if we are interested, it's easy. Uh, we studied a uh, couple things. Uh, two, uh, two more points. One point, in this recession, the situation for Kyrgyz is much better than for Uzbeks. Why? Because the union is working for Chechens, for, for Kyrgyz on the Russian labor market, uh, yeah. because they have some rights. Yeah, so yes, there is yes, already yes. some visible differences. Yeah, yeah. labor migration is one of the main uh, concern uh, for Uzbekistan in uh, yeah. uh, being a member. I was told by the manager of a huge vegetable um, uh, market uh, that it's hard to work with Kyrgyz. Uzbek is fine, it's hard to work with Kyrgyz because we have rights. Uh, if, and the last point, I have, um, if you are interested, I have a Ukrainian girl who re-emigrated from uh, Tashkent to Moscow, and now my postgraduate, but she's mm. originally uh, from Uzbekistan, she knows everything, and she's writing extensively on migration, especially for Uzbeks. So if yeah. you need a counterpart who knows the background and who is really in the business of, she's working for some European bank in Moscow, but she's my postgraduate. Uh, she, uh, she made an interesting study uh, serving uh, the motives of migration inside big pat patriarchic Uzbek families. And very interesting how it was changing upon a time. Because we started from sending one son to work to Russia to bring money. And nothing else. It was just dealing kind of uh, business trip 
to, uh, from family. And it, uh, later on, it was changing. It's very interesting how it's on, on the ground. Thank you. Thanks to you. Thank you. Thank um, you. Alexander, uh, may, I, uh, may I read a short statement? Sure, uh, you, you should. Okay, now I have to find it in my table. Okay, so just a short statement from uh, Alek Kozirov, who wished to participate uh, in our uh, uh, conference or forum-like uh, conference. Uh, and who is the representative of the Foreign Ministry of uh, Russian Federation and just became an ambassador at large. He is sending his video presentation, which I will be happy to share when it comes, but just three or four sentences from him since uh, I find them also very much important and very practical. What he wrote, Globalization in Africa, and he's in charge of Africa, let's say like this, has so far been implemented within the same parameters <laughs> and as in other regions of the world with the World Bank and IMF prescriptions prevailing. In parallel, integration processes at the regional and some regional levels took place. They were quite successful which was symbolized by the launch of the African continental free trade zone. The COVID-19 pandemic raised the question of making significant adjustments to plans for implementing the previous model of globalization and integration processes on the continent. There are opinions that the previous model of globalization is approaching a critical point or a point of deep transformation. We hope that your forum will allow us to understand the main trends in the processes of globalization, including the African continent. Just a remark for him, and thank you very much for listening. I think uh, Dr. Kartunov has joined us because I, I, I've got a message from him to follow the discussion. If not, then uh, we're a bit out of, uh, we're a bit uh, out of uh, schedule. Kolm, are you there? Yes. Kolm is Can not there. Oh, I oh. am here, yes. Then uh, could you take a floor? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. And then we'll, 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 we'll wait up until Andrei Kartunov uh, joins us. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Vladimir Kulikov, uh, who has really been uh, performing yeomanry service uh, to bring this, uh, this panel together. And I also greet uh, an old friend, Dr. Walter Schwimmer. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am going to give a 10 minute uh, outline of a project which wants to be very concrete, in fact, which is very concrete. And therefore, I sort of regretfully gave up on our exciting, uh, the temptation to, to give a sort of a very panoramic vision of uh, what the future of uh, the world and Eurasia uh, seems to be or uh, might be. And I will concentrate on what I might consider an intermediate stage in the process of uh, changing the global order as we know it. And when I say an intermediate stage, you will understand why when you will uh, hear that uh, essentially this is a very practical, methodical approach to changing the monetary structure of the world economy, because it's a very fundamental step uh, without which uh, we do not seem to be able to get out of the problems we have known over the last uh, several years. Uh, since uh, the uh, Nixon shock that uh, in 1971-72 cut off the link between the US dollar and gold, which therefore made the US dollar a completely unsupported fiat currency, 
even though there were substan substantive arrangements made uh, with the oil producers uh, to create the petrodollar. Uh, however, the fact is that the dollar has remained uh, an instrument uh, entirely submitted to uh, political and uh, other manipulations. And as a preamble, I may refer to the work of uh, economist Dr. Perry Merling uh, about the economics of money and banking, which he has uh, developed in various books and in his courses at the University of Columbia. Uh, he runs the Center for uh, Economic Institute for New Economic Thinking. And what he says in very few words is that the intertwining of uh, money and capital has created new vulnerabilities in the economy, which central banks have sought to address by trying desperate innovations, his own words, to stem the collapse. Cooperation between central banks showed the outline of an emerging international monetary order if indeed an agreement is reached. Modern money cannot be understood separately from modern finance. Monetary and financial theories are now inseparable. In the new system of market-based credit, dealers in capital and money markets are the profit-seeking suppliers of market liquidity. Given these conditions, can a satisfactory reform be carried out at the very core or foundation of the global monetary system? Now, yeah. many people have been working on this, and nowadays there is a flurry of articles uh, about what's happening to the dollar, especially in the light of the new crisis, in the context of the new crisis. And uh, my associate and friend uh, who is listening to us on this platform, uh, Mr. Deepak Lumba, uh, whom I would call an Indo-Russian, and I uh, have uh, put together this proposal. He originally wrote a book, uh, which I am going to summarize very briefly in this paper, which has been sent to Dr. Kulikov, and which therefore should be available for those interested. Now, I don't have to tell uh, the eminent uh, experts here that uh, the global economy is controlled by the dollar in the sense that there is no direct exchange rate between any currency. The exchange rate is in fact a conversion from any currency to the US dollar and from the US dollar into another currency. So the respective conversion rates are derived from their rates to the greenback. The dollar is indeed the international major and base currency. Now, we all know that this came from the Bretton Woods Agreement. I will not go into this any further because time is uh, not uh, free. And uh, I will uh, say, therefore, I will go on to say that uh, the whole system today is made possible by the willingness of the US to run a very large current account deficit while concurrently ensuring that the largest and most critical commodity of the century, oil, is priced and sold solely in US dollars. Now, therefore, every major, every transaction in the world is in fact, uh, in some way, uh, done through dollars. And uh, however, despite the massive production or printing of dollars by uh, the, the US Fed and Treasury, the US has not known substantially enforced these dollars are absorbed into the uh, global market, since countries all need dollars to be able to purchase such essential commodities as oil and gas. So there is also, of course, a speculative purchase sale of currency for future requirements. Such speculative sale purchase for future also impact the cost today, flattening the acuteness of future spikes and drops through gradual ramp-ups and ramp downs so if the US dollar were a normal currency, its excessive availability would have led to its devaluation in order to keep the system stable. However, as the additional dollars printed are bought uh, by other players for their uh, strategic speculative reserves, visible inflation is derived indefinitely. And today this has come to a head, as you know, because in the, uh, given the current crisis, uh, the Treasury and the uh, Federal Reserve have uh, printed a, and put into circulation another gigantic amount of dollars. Uh, it's running into several trillions. We don't know how many trillions will be uh, printed. Uh, depends upon who gets its way, whether the Republicans or Democrats. But even the Republicans have given up on any uh, attempt to balance the budget, and they are willing to incur 
uh, annual deficits uh, that are ever larger. The, before the crisis, it was a trillion dollar a year. Now we are going to see several trillion dollars a year. In other words, the deficit of the US could be five to 10% of its uh, annual GDP. Now, this leads us to the fact that uh, the system as it is now is probably unviable, but there is no clear solution to uh, this problem, which is putting the world economy into an unfair and in a way a dysfunctional situation. Because the question is that the more the crisis uh, increases, the more investors take refuge in the dollar. So the dollar strengthens when in fact it should be the other way around given the fact that there seems to be no responsible uh, policy as far as printing dollars in the US. And of course the US knows that and they feel that they can get away with it. Now, this has been made particularly visible by the role that China plays with the US as a mirror image. In the sense that China is doing quite the opposite. It is producing a lot of goods and services for the world and is selling them and accumulating dollars. As we know, there is now, there are probably about 4 trillion held between China and Hong Kong. But these dollars have to be somehow put to use, especially given the gradual evaluation and also the fact that uh, the treasury bonds of the US pay uh, no interest as such. So China, after essentially barred from the US investment uh, market in the sense that China is not allowed now to invest in corporations or industries regarded as strategic, has reacted by uh, planning the Belt and Road, which as we know, is uh, a very ambitious project, which has raised a lot of anxiety in America in particular, or in the West in general, but even among China's neighbors, such as India. And uh, we know that there is a growing conflict between the US and China, because uh, the US is now determined to put China down to prevent China from uh, becoming its successor as the global hegemon. And China, on the other hand, cannot really back down without impoverishing uh, very substantially its population and re renouncing its ambitions, which would be, of course, a very, very grievous blow to uh, the prestige and the viability of the Communist Party-led government. Now, where are we now? We uh, are seeing that uh, essentially in the last, uh, let's say, 30 years, the US has mismanaged its economy and has abused the exorbitant privilege, this was a Cambridge term, uh, to define the US role in printing the global reserve currency. But the alternatives have always been of two kinds. One has been, of course, gold, which is seen as a refuge by a lot of conservative investors. But we all know that gold does not always, in fact, does not generally meet the requirements of today's economy in terms of size, in terms of flexibility, and in terms of speed of transactions. And then on the other hand, we have seen the phenomenon of the cryptocurrency and cyber currencies in the last several few years. But we know that Bitcoin, the most famous one, uh, is not really uh, serving the purpose of a global currency for obvious reasons, including the fact that we are not able to see how much value Bitcoin will have at any time in the future. Uh, therefore, uh, no matter what happens following the crisis of 2008, for example, the major banks, the, the central banks and the major banks of the other great financial powers, such as Japan, Germany, uh, Britain, France, they all held more dollars than they held in their own currencies. The euro, the euro has not replaced the dollar and is not about to do that, especially with growing doubts now about the stability of the European financial system, which seems to be pretty much dependent on Germany. Uh, and then therefore, now we see China coming up in the last few days with its uh, first test of a cyber yuan, which essentially uh, shows the Chinese desire to gradually globalize the yuan and make it into a currency that can easily be used for international transactions. However, no matter what China does, the yuan is still a Chinese government instrument. Many countries may not be comfortable with that. 
I won't even talk about the special drawing rights of the IMF because that would be a fairly long talk, but the fact that it is essentially a basket of currencies make it, makes it in some ways uh, not sufficient to meet the needs of the global economy. Uh, and in the sense that it uh, would uh, balance the world uh, exchanges, it would essentially uh, support the global exchanges of uh, goods and services with five or six major currencies, including the yuan, and of course the dollar. So essentially you are not changing the essence of the system. So then what would be a viable solution which would not overthrow the dollar and therefore cause a massive shock which would result in uh, international tensions and perhaps in war, and yet would not keep the dollar as the, you know, the arbiter, the, the control instrument of the economy. And as we see now with the current the policies of the US, we see a sort of a blurring of borders between the treasury and the Federal Reserve, even though the Federal Reserve is not technically a government body. So the idea, and I must give credit to, uh, again, to Mr. Deepak Lumba, who has worked on this for years, and we came together from two different backgrounds to work further on this project. The, con the concept would be to create a, not a currency, but an instrument of exchange, a derivative note, which would have the dollar as its floor value, which means it would not go below uh, $1, for each one unit of this uh, derivative instrument. And yet it could float and rise as high above the dollars as it's uh, the mechanics of the market uh, warrant. So in that sense, investors who would own this instrument, whether states, corporations, or individuals, would be protected because uh, no matter what, they could always get reimbursed in US dollars. And all the US dollars which would be used to acquire this instrument would then be flowed back into the US economy, which would therefore get a welcome boost for actual industrial revitalization and could concentrate on its own market rather than depending on foreign markets to uh, buy its dollars, as it were, to supply it with the goods that the US could produce but no longer produce. Now, many people have said the U.S. cannot go back to being an industrial society because it's, uh, let's say, the cost of living and the cost of labor is too high. But with uh, robotics and technology, the cost of uh, labor is no longer an essential problem. Therefore, you, would, you could envisage a U.S. reindustrializing and not being a sort of a global comprador economy, a rentier economy, as uh, Professor... Uh, I believe it was Professor Gregoriev who defined Rome as a rentier city. Now the US has become the Rome of the modern world and there is a need to replace that uh, system with an instrument which would be regulated and controlled through blockchain and through artificial intelligence. Therefore the stability, the fairness and the transparency would be critical factors. And it would give everyone the ability to watch the use of the currency of that uh, instrument and its uh, liquidity and its uh, circulation in real time. And at the same time would eliminate the cost and the time uh, delays in transactions. We believe that the world is no matter what going in that direction. So the instrument that we have devised, we call it Indicia because uh, in a way it was uh, uh, born in India. And it's a nice name which suggests uh, index and other uh, such uh, nouns. And it would, as a result, be an instrument that would be neutral. It wouldn't be Chinese. It wouldn't be American. It, would, uh, it could possibly be housed in Europe in terms of its regulatory mechanism. Uh, or it could be housed in another country which has good relations with both East-West. But the main idea is that it would provide a common global fair platform for trade transaction and uh, would bring the dollar back to its natural original goal, which was to be a currency for the United States and not a currency for the world. So I would end by saying that uh, for a long time, there has been a, a need to revise and reform the Bretton Woods systems, which is now, which has, was created in 1944, 45. 
And the Bretton Woods system is like the United Nations system. It's an outdated system because either technologically or geopolitically, it no longer reflects the conditions of today's world. And therefore, if we can engineer this kind of a reform, and we are not proposing it as a sort of a single private product that should be adopted by all. We are saying that this is a model which can be applied, uh, developed, further perfected. And if other agencies, whether governments or private enterprises are willing to come up with their own proposals in the same direction, then let the best one win, in the sense. Let's not uh, try to impose a particular uh, system or a particular uh, brand, but let's look at what can be done that really meets the needs of the world economy at a very critical stage where we are facing the prospect of a global collapse. So I will leave it there. And the paper, as I said, has been sent in advance. So hopefully it will be available. Uh, and of course, there is a book which is also available on Amazon and uh, on the other uh, inter inter uh, electronic media to be consulted. And it's about Indicia, so it's easy to find. There is a website called indicia.com where suggestions, comments, and reactions are welcome. So thank you very much, and uh, let us hope something comes out of all this. Dear Colm, thank you very much. It was a pleasure, as always. And uh, I think we should, uh, we should think of uh, a small additional effort after the conference. And uh, I mean, would anyone, anyone join me in trying to summarize all the practical aspects? Because I mean, it's not, it's, it's a forum like conference, that's for sure. But I'm, I mean, I'm not a specialist in every sphere. So in order not to impose my own vision on, on what has occurred today, just think maybe someone could join me in a day or two in order to summarize different, uh, like, like uh, draw a tree of a practical tree of the conference. And with this remark, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Andrei Kortunov, who is the head of the Russian International Affairs uh, Council. And uh, hopefully you will enjoy his uh, report as much as you did before. Thank you very much, Andrei. Well, thank you, Vladimir. Uh, uh, it's nice to be here and to see some of uh, old friends around. Uh, as you can see from my uh, nice uh, screensaver, my vision of the world is not particularly optimistic. Uh, however, it's clearly not the end of story. Uh, so it gives us some uh, food for thought for the analysis of implications of the current crisis uh, for various uh, international actors. And the uh, discussion right now in Russia, and not only in Russia, about whether the crisis is a game changer, whether indeed uh, the world will be very different uh, from what it is right now in one or in two years, uh, or whether the crisis will be just a blip on the radar screen and uh, we will see gradually getting back uh, to normal. What is clear, however, is that um, each of uh, international actors has challenges uh, and also opportunities right now. And uh, some challenges and opportunities are purely situational and tactical. Some of them are strategic. So since I was uh, told that I have only 10 minutes uh, to express my views, I'd like to limit myself uh, uh, to speculating about uh, challenges and opportunities uh, that the crisis uh, creates for Russia. And uh, let me limit myself to three opportunities, which I consider to be important, and also three challenges, which I see in front of the Russia's leadership. Uh, first, let me start uh, with the uh, opportunities. Uh, I think that uh, the first very clear <clears throat> implication of the crisis is that uh, it confirms the Russian narrative, or more specifically, the Kremlin's narrative about the international system, about the world, 
about the driving forces and about the future development of the world. And narratives do matter. So <coughs> in terms of narratives, for a long time, the Russian leadership emphasized the supremacy of national sovereignty, of uh, non-interference uh, into internal affairs. The Russian leadership exercised <coughs> skepticism <coughs> in multilateral structures. It also pursued a transactional approach to international system. The odds are that the crisis confirms this narrative and brings us back to the old nice Westphalian system where states are unquestionably the most important actor of the international system. <coughs> to some extent, the crisis justifies the actions that uh, the state has taken before, like import substitution, for example, or even to some extent self-isolation. Self Definitely, there is another dimension of uh, this narrative, <clears throat> which suggests that uh, essentially the liberal idea has depleted its creative potential and that in the current world, liberalism, <coughs> liberalism is on decline. The way how China handled the pandemic compared to Europe and to the United States gives a lot of arguments to support this view. So this is the first advantage and I'm sure that uh, the Russian state media will make most of this out of these opportunities to make the case. We are right, you are wrong. We know what direction the world is moving to and you do not. The second uh, important uh, opportunity uh, is that uh, uh, in certain ways, uh, the crisis uh, implies that uh, most of Russia's strategic opponents are likely to be obsessed with domestic issues. So that uh, creates a vacuum of power, especially in the developing world, uh, which uh, the Russian foreign policy uh, can exploit to its advantage. Especially if you take Middle East, if you take North Africa and some other parts of the African continent. I think the crisis uh, creates uh, clearly opportunities uh, for further expansion of the Russian international influence at relatively low cost. I think that if we see new examples of uh, Russian assertiveness in this part of the world, uh, it will be more like the Libyan rather than the Syrian uh, scenario. This model implies indirect engagement uh, with relatively uh, low investment and uh, it allows Russia uh, to punch above its weight. Finally, uh, the crisis the current disagreements between Russia and its Western partners or adversaries, no matter how you call them, uh, to, the, uh, to the back of the political scene because other events and other challenges become by far more important uh, than the conflict between Russia and the West. Uh, and that uh, might uh, mean that some mini or micro detente or even a kind of reset in the relations between Russia and the West is possible. Not now, not uh, in the way it was a couple of years ago, but definitely it uh, might mean some kind of accommodation because the challenges are simply too important and too dangerous for everybody to ignore them and uh, to let uh, uh, them uh, uh, be subordinated uh, to the old type confrontation between Moscow and Western capitals. However, there are also challenges and let me also limit myself to only three of you of three of these challenges, 
which I consider to be the most uh, apparent. Uh, first of all, I think that uh, it's almost clear, especially if you take the example of the uh, last uh, financial economic crisis of 2008 to 2009, Russia as an emerging economy, economy is likely to suffer more uh, than developed economies. Uh, and uh, indeed it means that uh, uh, the recovery in uh, 2021 doesn't look very probable. Uh, the odds are that uh, Russia will be constrained, uh, including uh, important constraints its foreign policy in its foreign policy. The Russian foreign policy uh, will, will not allow, or rather the economic environment will not allow a resource consumer foreign policy, uh, a lot of investment uh, into the defense sector. So it might create limitations on power projection capabilities of the Russian Federation. Uh, moreover, the asymmetry between Russia and its partners, uh, especially China, is likely to grow, uh, which might create political problems for Moscow as well. Uh, second, uh, one of the most uh, evident uh, uh, repercussions of the crisis in terms of the moods in the Russian society is that Russia, like many other states, uh, uh, becomes more isolationist. So a foreign policy victory uh, cannot be exploited as a substitute uh, for real uh, rise of uh, 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 household incomes uh, or economic growth uh, or social progress. Uh, moreover, foreign policy activism uh, can be regarded not as, as an asset, but rather as a liability for the leadership. And we already uh, saw some of the uh, quite critical, I would say negative reactions to Russia assisting other countries like Venezuela, for example, in uh, fighting the pandemic. Uh, that means that uh, what sociologists used to label as uh, the Crimea uh, consensus uh, is likely uh, to end and uh, to, if you excuse me, just a, uh, uh, is likely to, uh, 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 to uh, to fail to serve the purpose it served for last six years. Uh, second, uh, uh, and finally, I think the most important thing is that uh, 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 many argue that uh, the current crisis uh, is uh, going to result uh, with a new, with a new uh, uh, bipolarity between uh, China uh, and the United States. And uh, if it is the case, uh, I think new bipolarity, especially if it is a rigid bipolarity, uh, will definitely not serve Russia's interests. On the, on the contrary, uh, it will uh, uh, create additional problems for Russian Federation simply because in many cases, it will limit the scale uh, of uh, the Russian foreign policy and the scope for maneuvering uh, between the two centers of global power. Thank you. Thank you very much. A very thoughtful, uh, <laughs> a very thoughtful presentation that uh, makes us a bit um, puzzled by the optimism which we have been trying to show in almost every statement before you came in. And uh, well, it's a sobering effect. And uh, thank you very much for that also. And uh, again, it was. Uh, very important uh, input, if not to say crucial to all the structure that has been uh, 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 engineered b b before before b before, uh, before you came in. So uh, my proposal is that uh, after uh, hearing all the this very presentation, we really need to 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 have a small working group that could that could. Uh, spend very little time on uh, collecting the arguments because they are very uh, concrete, very pragmatic, very practical, and we could divide in between political, uh, let's say, se section, financial section, economic se section, socioeconomic section, as well as uh, 
as well as cultural one and the cultural of our civilization. Thank you again. Uh, Alexander Gasparishvili, uh, uh, is there anyone standing in the line? I don't, uh, I mean, I'm planning the piano, but I-, I Sorry, I, sorry. Uh, we have a presentation. It will be a final presentation of uh, Dr. Yelena Shlachovaya. She is a research fellow of a Russian Research Institute of Economics, Politics, and Law in uh, Science and Technology. Uh, Dr. Shlachavaya? Dr. Shlachavaya, are you ready? Yes. Uh, you speak uh, in Russian or in English? Uh, so I speak, I will speak on Russian. Russian, okay, good, great. Uh, just a moment. I will turn on your uh, presentation. Just, wait. just a moment. Uh, just a moment. Here it is. Here it is. Well, oh, well. Oh. Um, thanks. Я могу начать. Uh -huh. Благодарю. Уважаемые участники, вот мой доклад, наш доклад по нашему исследованию, скорее всего, это как пример того, как глобальные проблемы, обозначенные уже в докладах предыдущих участников, они приводят к локальным исследованиям, результатом которых, как мы надеемся, должны стать управленческие решения, принимаемые на государственном уровне. Ну, соответственно, задача нашего была исследования и основная проблема, и то, что построила программу этого исследования, это необходимость составления авторского перечня должностей научных работников, который должен действовать на территории Российской Федерации. Потому что в настоящее время в законодательстве, регулирующем эту сферу, нет четко прописанного перечня должностей научных работников. Соответственно, выборка, как вы видите на слайде, у нас состояла из 251 организации. Условно, генеральная совокупность, она была более. Это были организации подведомственные нашему Министерству науки и образования. И, соответственно, с учетом классификации ОСР у нас были представлены, по сути, все наши науки. Следующий слайд, пожалуйста. Второй слайд. Все. Спасибо. В результате проведенного вопроса, который был экспертизой нашего перечня со стороны профессионального сообщества, и в результате оценок составленных нами должностей на соответствие самому главному критерию о ключевом содержании научной деятельности, данный критерий мы выделили на основе федерального закона о науке которые действуют в настоящее время на территории Российской Федерации, мы увидели, что наши должности, они условно делятся на три группы. Должности, получившие максимальное количество одобрений, то есть они в большей степени соответствуют данному критерию. Должности, получившие практически нейтральные оценки, и должности, получившие максимальное количество отклонений. И, соответственно, когда мы посмотрели как бы, функционал, должностей, входящих в каждую группу, мы увидели, что в первую должности лидеры. В первую очередь туда попали должности, которые уже существуют в нашем законодательстве согласно приказу Министерства науки и образования, то есть это те, которые подлежат помещению по конкурсу, и в меньшей степени попали должности из образовательных организаций высшего образования. Ну, если можно, Александр Кумилевич, сейчас попрошу вот быстро буквально показать третий слайд. Так, пожалуйста. Третий слайд. Так, есть. Третий слайд – это вот как раз должности лидера, если вот вы видите, здесь уже известные всем нам должности старшего научного сотрудника, профессора. То есть, по сути, результат довольно такой предсказуемый и объяснимый. То, что нам уже хорошо знакомо в наших представлениях, естественно, будет на первом месте. Четвертый слайд, если можно, покажите, пожалуйста. Это группа должностей, получивших практически нейтральные оценки. В колонках вы видите как средний балл, так и стандартное отклонение. Здесь мы посмотрели по функционалу, и сюда попали должности, которые связаны с научно-технической деятельностью. 
И э, пятый слайд, если можно. Сейчас это группа должностей, которые получили наибольшее количество отклонений. То есть э, респонденты решили, что они менее всего соответствуют нашему ключевому критерию о содержании научной деятельности. А, как вы видите, должности сами по себе они интересны. Сейчас у нас вот, первый слайд я вижу. Сейчас, Раз, вот это и... пятый, правильно? Так, э, пятый, да. Спасибо, пятый слайд сейчас. Это как раз нейтральные оценки должности. А вот сейчас мы перейдем к пятому слайду. А это, вот, спасибо. Если вы обратите внимание, то функционал данных должностей, по сути, это то, чем занимаемся мы в нашем институте, это аналитическая деятельность. Пока, к сожалению, в представлениях профессионального сообщества или представителей науки данные должности Наверное, все-таки из-за из того, что они не знакомы, к ним еще не привыкли, респонденты посчитали, что они меньше всего соответствуют главному критерию о ключевом содержании научной деятельности. Если можно, шестой слайд. Они у нас так отражают. Также параллельно с оценкой и экспертизой данных должностей мы собирали еще ретроспективу данных за 2015-2019 год о количестве молодых ученых постарались именно в разрезе предложенных нами должностей. И, как видите, большая часть концентрации молодых ученых, как нам представили респонденты, она относится к первой группе должностей. Опять же, подтверждает то, что эти должности знакомы и понятны. Но все-таки остальные результаты статистические, несмотря на минимальные проценты, они дают нам надежду о том, что должности второй и третьей группы они все-таки обладают определенным потенциалом и полезностью для нашего, нашей научной сферы, то есть имеет смысл действительно их отнести к категории научных работников, потому что хоть как огромное количество молодых исследователей все-таки уже сейчас, даже вот за прошедшие годы там присутствовало. Ну и, соответственно, еще мы предложили открытые вопросы респондентам, Нуждается ли наш перечень в доработке? Большая часть ответила, что нет. А в качестве должностей, которые можно было бы включить в этот перечень, коллеги представили, вот как видите на экране, тоже должности, относящиеся больше и к ныне педагогическим, то есть из сферы образовательных организаций высшего образования. Можно седьмой слайд? Последний, как бы каждое исследование, оно ставит задачу это ограничение перспектив. В чем как бы, основная проблема нашего исследования? Надежды, которые мы ставили и задачи, они довольно глобальные. То есть, по сути, это разработка автор, э, перечной должностей научных работников, которые можно при, применять на территории всей нашей страны. Соответственно, это должно упростить кадровое дело производства, в частности, э, учет трудового стажа научных работников. Соответственно, еще это как бы, административное... Решение такого вопроса, как вот мы статистику уже считаем, и в мировых базах УСР это ее численность исследователей, численность молодых исследователей, численность исследователей в эквиваленте полной занятости. Когда у нас много должностей, то, соответственно, и статистически у нас возникает возможность пересматривать те национальные цифры, национальную статистику, которую мы подаем в мировые базы данных. Но, соответственно, те задачи, которые мы поставили, они столкнулись и с ограничениями. В первую очередь, то, что мы опрашивали организации ограничены, это подведомственные нашему Министерству науки и образования. Соответственно, из выборки совершенно выпали организации, подведомственные другим ФАИВом. И их, их участие в подобном опросе, оно, конечно, бы более сделал бы достоверными наши результаты, или, по крайней мере, дискуссия бы и оценка была более объемной. Ну и, соответственно, то, что я уже обозначила в начале, что э, подобный перечень, он дает возможность пересмотреть национальную статистику от численности исследователей, он как раз ставит вопрос о необходимости пересмотра наших национальных форм статистической отчетности. А, на примере мы знаем все, что научные организации отчитываются формой «Два наука», сотрудников. Эти же научные сотрудники попадают и в отчет для образовательных организаций. Соответственно, чтобы не было дублирования должностей и чтобы у нас не получилось 
каких-то некорректных цифр. Чем это плохо? Национальная статистика, хорошая, красивая статистика, она может скрыть ситуацию, которая происходит. Ну и, соответственно, определенные отношения пространства того, что происходит на территории той или иной страны. Вот так кратко хотелось вам представить результаты нашей работы о том, что глобальная задача, которая сейчас обозначена в большинстве передовых стран, это привлечение в науку как можно большего количества исследователей. На примере нашей страны мы сталкиваемся с тем, что в этой отрасли оказывается вопрос, на какие даже должности нужно оформлять тех исследователей, которые мы собираемся привлекать для решения глобальной задачи социально-экономического развития. Ну, благодарю вас за внимание. Большое спасибо, Елена. Очень интересное выступление. Как раз вот ваша тема, ваша работа во многом пересекается с деятельностью Центра стратегии развития образования МГУ. Наверное, вам нужно с ними будет связаться. И Спасибо. это вполне, вполне можно было бы рассчитывать на какое-то сотрудничество. Спасибо большое, коллеги. Владимир, может быть, вы завершите, скажете несколько слов. И можно будет заканчивать наш круглый стол, потому что после него нам еще предстоит с вами весьма серьезная работа. Пожалуйста, Владимир. Dear Walter, uh, would, you, would, you, would you like to uh, uh, summarize uh, what we have uh, heard today? Uh, and uh, uh, I, I will inform you that we, we have found some... Uh, members of the working group and we'll start our technological cooperation uh, in assessing uh, all the arguments and uh, main topics that have been touched upon uh, quite fast uh, and uh, I, I, I'm really waiting for some words of you. Okay. I don't think he, Walter hears me well. For some reason, I think his microphone is off. So, his microphone is off, and I believe. Okay. So, uh, do you think we need some further discussion, uh, friends? If if so, I I would welcome very much your short uh, short proposals on how we should. We might, if, if, if it's not too time consuming to you, for you, we might continue in between, uh, in between uh, let's say, uh, our possible next session. There, there is nothing that uh, formally prevents us from holding uh, a small seminar uh, or a small Zoom uh, seminar in, in a week or two from now. I mean, At least from my part, I see no big problem. And uh, we can then uh, again spend uh, rising uh, and distributing all the reports available and all the, uh, all the proposals that uh, we could gather. What do you think of that? It's not an Austrian way of doing things, but it's a very Russian way of dealing with complex constructions. You do uh, 10 things simultaneously in uh, hope that finally everything will, will work, work out well. Okay, so uh, if there are no uh, uh, immediate suggestions, let me uh, thank you very much on behalf of the uh, International Institute of uh, Social and Economic Studies in Vienna, and uh, hopefully you have uh, enjoyed this uh, meeting, and uh, at least you don't find it uh, 
just an, another one in the sets of the meeting and Zoom conferences that you are uh, experienced almost every day, many times. So just remember us as guys with uh, cautious optimism that uh, possibly is not very characteristic of uh, general mood of experts sitting at home. But nevertheless, uh, thank you very much again. And we really appreciate your presence, your reports. And uh, let's communicate. We, we have all emails. Uh, we have all uh, texts. Uh, whoever needs anything, I'll be happy to assist. Thank you for the... Uh, for the brilliant guidance of uh, Professor Gasparishvili, and thank you for the MSU, uh, uh, let's say, effort to provide us and assistance and uh, uh, providing us the floor inside this very important uh, uh, globalistic uh, Congress and uh, giving us, uh, let's say, the pleasure of meeting each other uh, at this. Uh, Nice spring day. Thank you very much. And the last few words, it's truly the last few words. Well, uh, I am very happy when we could manage it, this very important round table. And I believe uh, deeply and absolutely that next time we could meet in person uh, here in Moscow in a Lamanosov Moscow State University when uh, organizing a new next the seventh uh, international uh, Congress Globalistics 2022. Thank you very much again and hope to see you again. Bye. Yeah. Thank you, bye. Thank you. We'll bye. be in touch by email all of us, I'm sure. Sure, we will. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Goodbye. Bye bye. Do Svidania. Spasiba. Spasiba. Bye bye.